of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. We read one day, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if a man doesn't have a job or an income, he has neither life nor liberty and the possibility for the pursuit of happiness. He merely exists that we spend $322,000 for each enemy we kill in Vietnam while we spend in the so-called war on poverty in America only about $53 for each person classified as poor. The other thing I want you to understand is this, that it didn't cost the nation one penny to integrate lunch counters. It didn't cost the nation one penny to guarantee the right to vote. But now we are dealing with issues that cannot be solved without the nation spending billions of dollars and undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. Yes. All labor has dignity. Yes. But you are doing another thing. You are reminding not only Memphis but you are reminding the nation that it is a crime for people to live in this rich nation and receive starvation wages. America's opportunity to help bridge the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. And the question is whether America will do it. There's nothing new about poverty. What is new is that we now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. And the real question is whether we have the will. Right. My name is Ben Burgess. I am joined, as always, by our producer, Forrest Miller. How's it going? Uh, <laughs> pretty good. Uh, and in just a few minutes, uh, we'll be speaking uh, to Michael Albert. Uh, but, of course, the uh, the voice you just heard uh, was Martin Luther King um, talking about uh, subjects that uh, are not typically uh, part of uh, of what's discussed on Martin Luther King Day, which uh, which is today this year. Uh, certainly, you know, for for me, you know, I mean, I, I you know, I, I know there are you know parts of the country where people don't, but you know, I grew up having like you know Martin Luther King Day assemblies and stuff, and it was never ever the case uh, that um, that we got clips like that there, right? Like that, yeah. You know, anything remotely similar to that well it really i mean he thought of it as a as a two-part civil rights struggle right so he thought of it as you know uh segregation ending and and pushing towards that which is the first part but then the second part was his like radical redistribution of wealth and ending of poverty which um you know is something that lbj kind of talked about as well but obviously didn't really put resources into because by the time that kind of came around with this war on poverty we were you know knee deep in the vietnam war but like I, I think that, you know, part one gets discussed everywhere. Like everybody loves part one, you know what I mean? Liberals, conservatives, right. but part two, of course, and which is the less successful part never gets discussed because it's, you know, far too socialistic for, <laughs> for most yeah. people to capitalize on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, th I think one of the things that always really strike me uh, watching clips like that is that nearly everybody who, um, who sort of, appropriates his legacy and uh which you know which everybody does because you know he's um you know he's like uh you know i mean he's like a saint in you know contemporary american culture even yeah. though you know when he died uh he was actually an extremely controversial figure 
uh, like the like even a lot of liberals who had maybe supported the uh, efforts to desegregate lunch counters and whatnot uh, didn't you know didn't like him at that point because it was uh, because he was denouncing you know the Johnson administration's war in Vietnam uh, yeah. because, uh, he was widely blamed uh, for uh, for riots. Uh, if you read, you know, if you read like Rick Perlstein's book, he'll talk about uh, ways that, like the Chicago Tribune, you know, was was editorializing about Martin Luther King at the time, and that they'd say, oh well, he says he's against riots, but they keep on happening anyway. So either he's not really against them, or you know, and he really wants to start them, or else he's ineffective. And you uh, see that, and you see that, you know, going up to this day with any kind of civil rights or you know, Black Lives Matter, anything like that. You know what I mean? Like they get thrown under the bus for the riots first before anybody. Yeah. So, um, so even though as controversial as he was then, uh, he's, you know, extremely uncontroversial now. He's like the least controversial, you know, figure of the 20th century uh, now. Uh, but uh, he's somebody who, who would disagree in one way or another with, uh, you know, with almost everybody, you know, who, um, you know, who, who, talks up his legacy now uh so certainly as you say you know the the way that's focused on is very exclusively about part one mm -hmm. uh that because those those battles have been won uh and so they're they're relatively on uh, they're relatively uncontroversial now but then the obvious follow-up question is uh okay so you've you've done that right you have full legal equality uh, but what are you going to do to have more substantive, you know, quality? Because obviously, look around you, uh, there are uh, there are these these massive disparities and in, in outcomes, you know, between uh, between the races, uh, you know, so called races. And the conservative analysis is it's like oh, it's something about culture, you know, that mm -hmm. you know uh, people just need to pull their pants up or something, you know, that yeah. would, that's the conservative. Yeah, the, boot, the bootstraps, uh, you know, the bootstraps ideology yeah. idea yeah and the uh and the sort of liberal analysis uh is it's um that it's the, the problem like the main residual problem is just uh racism in the sense of the attitudes and you know in people's heads mm -hmm. uh, and that this you know so maybe you can have you know increased efforts of diversity affirmative action whatever but you know that's that's the that would solve that problem but the analysis that the king had was that no, uh, the, you you have to do something about the overall distribution of, of wealth in society, uh, and and that that's the only way to to really do it. That you know because yeah, the effect of capitalism is to basically you know freeze uh, the um, you know like results of past legally mandated racial hierarchy, like a you know. The insect trapped in amber at the beginning of Jurassic Park. Uh, so if you, so the, you know, you have to do something massively redistributive to uh, to do something about that. About that, which his focus was very exclusively on. In fact, I think, uh, and you know, I mean, whatever. I, I think he was right about almost all of this stuff. I think that the only things, uh, I think that he. I think he was bad on Palestine, although he also died in 1968. Yeah, it was, it was far before the, you know, the settlements and the, the way that things, it was before the Antifadas. It was before, like, before really, you know, um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was. What it is now. Yeah, it had taken the form that it would take. Mm -hmm. like, the, uh, the, like, when he was assassinated, the occupation had lasted for, you know, months rather than years, never mind decades. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, so I, I think he may very well have have changed that, but um, which which came up a little bit in the Georgia special election, you know, because when Warnock was actually backing off of some of his good positions on that, he sort of used uh, King's bad positions as a crutch for that. But uh, but in general, I think that you'd have so obviously, you know, mainstream conservatives who don't even like you know who are like opposed to affirmative action even, you know, wouldn't like really almost any of his post desegregated lunch counters positions, yeah. if, you know, uh, if they, they knew about them or would admit them and, you know, grapple with them, uh, you know, liberals uh, clearly wouldn't uh, even within the left. I mean, honestly, I think that given this sort of analysis we just talked about and who's actually pretty relentless focus on economic solutions as what you do after you've achieved 
you know, civic and legal equality, right? You know, once once the once you have everybody is being equal in the eyes of the law, his solution to the remaining problem was relentlessly in terms of economics. And even while we're uh, finishing that project, um, so uh, like I, I talked about in my discussion with Harvey Kay on the very first episode of the show, I think we might watch the clip in a minute. Um, the like it's 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 weird how much that's been disappeared from the picture, you know. Right, the 1964 march was the march on Washington for jobs and freedom, uh, mm-hmm. and and you know, like you would not guess from the way people talk about it that the jobs and was in there, but and that's and that's the the march where uh, King is like most famous, you know. I have a dream speech, which is is really the the high point of uh, you know of of the part one solution i guess to it yeah totally uh and, and so that's quoted in a way that that ignore you know that ignores uh the rest of the program and again the rest of the program was so relentlessly economic that honestly i think if martin luther king or like his close associate bayard rustin uh were alive today they'd probably be denounced as class reductionists you know for for yeah. thinking that all you know that like economics would uh you know would be the remaining solution after you'd uh, after you'd achieved uh, legal equality that, you know, you really don't like, um, I mean, if you go look at the signs at the March on Washington, you know, you see stuff of course about, uh, about civil rights laws, uh, and police brutality, which is certainly a, a thread connecting that to, uh, to later efforts. Mm-hmm. Uh, but otherwise everything there is about universalist economic programs, you know, jobs, housing, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which they understood would, uh, would disproportionately, benefit uh black americans as opposed to white americans because black americans were much more likely to uh to be you know hungry homeless lack health care etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. uh but were things that were very much pitched at at everybody and uh when you know when king uh like in those last few years the the years they always skip past at the uh at the martin luther king day assemblies you know in high schools and whatnot uh well, major part of what he was doing was the poor people's campaign. You know, again, those sort of trying like very explicitly universalist economic pitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, let's let's get together all of the poor people to uh, to oppose uh, to oppose poverty. And I, and it's kind of the you know the starting line metaphor, I guess. You know what I mean? And and you can put conservatives, liberals, and then the more socialistic place that uh, Martin Luther King was at, kind of on on that graph. And it's like you know at the end of part one conservatives who today claim that you know what i mean like they would have been for civil rights which they definitely wouldn't but let's right. say that they would they would leave you know they would leave everybody that just uh gained their civil rights at that starting line you know what i mean like where they were and they'd say all right you know what i mean run whereas liberals would kind of try to make sure that the, the best runners get pushed up towards the the front of the line but everyone else would kind of remain behind that and you know, at the same time, something more universal would make sure that, you know, not just poor black people, but poor white people, you know, all poor people kind of get pushed towards, you know, towards the the, the gap, I guess the, the gap between everybody gets reduced by quite a bit. And it's no longer, you know, in terms of race, it's in terms of class. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So, um, and and I think that there are even, you know, there are even lots of places where, you know, he, he even does go beyond the the very robustly social democratic program that's even present at the march on washington uh and certainly later you know with the uh, the freedom budget uh and um you know calls for uh, for a federal uh, federal jobs guarantee um you know ubi not in the not in the libertarian sense that you know would, would like substitute for everything else but you know but as as part of a much larger suite of uh, public programs uh, and and there are even places uh, where where he goes, you know, where he sort of says, especially in you know letters and you know a few in contexts like that, that no, we really do need to go beyond this completely. That you know that you that capitalism itself is the problem. You know, mm-hmm. he, you know, he was a little vague about it, but you know, he'd say some sort of democratic socialist so, you know system, you know, needs to substitute for capitalism per se. And then, of course, most controversially, maybe. Uh, in some ways in, uh, in mainstream politics, uh, you know, they, he gave, you know, towards the very end of his life, uh, that, uh, beyond Vietnam speech, uh, where he says that, um, he, uh, he can't, you know, he talks about going around, uh, in inner cities where there had been riots 
and you know giving people his message about you know nonviolent met- you know methods of of achieving social change. So you know to be fair, that is part of it. Sometimes people do misleadingly quote you know the that phrase about riots is the language of the unheard. But yeah. um, but then the punchline is look when I go around and, and say you know this is not the you know this is not you know, a good strategy. And, you know, he's obviously is coming from a, you know, uh, Christian moral worldview. So he's giving more than a strategic critique, but when he goes around and does all of that, he, uh, he says that the response he'll get is what is second. What about the massive doses of violence, uh, that the U S government is, uh, is doling out in Southeast Asia. And essentially he says, good point. That's why I decided, uh, yeah. to, to, to give this speech. And he says all kinds of things in that speech. I have that, I have that queued up. If, you know, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's watch a few. Let's watch, let's watch a little bit. Uh, we, we want to, uh, I have, I have like two minutes of it queued yep. up. Um, hold on. that riots are socially destructive and self-defeating. I'm still convinced that non-violence is the most potent weapon available to oppress people in their struggle for freedom and justice. I feel that violence will only create more social problems than they will solve, that in a real sense it is impractical for the Negro to even think of mounting a violent revolution in the United States. So I will continue to condemn riots and continue to say to my brothers and sisters that this is not the way. Continue to affirm that there is another way. But at the same time, it is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to feel that they must engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. What is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. It has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. Yeah, and uh, and the foreign policy, you know, part parts of the speech are at least as radical. He talks about the United States being on the uh, wrong side of you know revolutions of barefooted people around the world, um, and uh, and you know he talks about uh, the he talks about the Vietnamese revolution in a way that you know makes it clear that you know obviously he's not a Stalinist or anything, but he's. Uh, but he's deeply sympathetic, you know, to uh, to the, the you know the causes and the fundamental goals uh, of that uh, of that revolutionary struggle. Uh, so, you know, if people haven't uh, haven't checked that out, uh, I think uh, you know, I mean, it, they should. Uh, it's uh, you know, I I think that if you're going to hear as much as you do about Martin Luther King in American society today, uh, you know, and you've you know you've probably even heard today. Uh, then, uh, then you should, you know, then you owe it to yourself to, uh, to, you know, to find out, uh, 
you know, what he, uh, what he thought about all of this stuff. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's certainly a much richer and, and more radical legacy. And, you know, and, and I think there's, there's also a, um, I think there's also a little lesson in, in the other direction, right? I remember Michael Brooks used to, you know, like put it this way a couple times, you know, that they like that at the same time, there are other superficially more radical currents going on, but really it's the guys in the, uh, in the start shirts, uh, you know, with the, the kind of, you know, message of legal rights and, and social democratic programs who, who had the, the much more compelling, uh, program. So, uh, before we, uh, before we bring on Michael Albert, you want to, uh, you want to do just a minute of Harvey K? Yeah. So, so I, I, I guess one, one thing, thing you know, you know that, that I, I also, also wanted to tie this into was that you know there's there's been this kind of longstanding uh, you know pre Andrew Yang right you know debate yeah, yeah. on uh, on the left uh, about whether the idea that we should have some kind of like universal support for having some kind of livelihood uh, should take the form of something like a UBI um, or it should take the form of something like a universal jobs guarantee. Uh, which um, is also, I know something you know that that I've, I've heard you talk about before, uh, and and you know we've only got a minute now, but I really hope you're going to come back to talk more about this with me. I, I'll, I'll be back all the time to be with you. All right. Uh, so in um, you know, and this 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 other demand, this universal jobs guarantee, this jobs for all demand, right. uh, is something that uh, was uh, historic though he gave the speech that has become the iconic speech of the day. Now, it's also worth noting if we full employment, which was to say the right to a job. Now, in 1940, sorry, in 1963, it's A. Philip Randolph, the black and black civil rights and decidedly labor leader who was himself a socialist, who actually organized- The, with, the uh, sleeping car porters you did, right? Right, the brotherhood of sleeping car porters, right. And they, they're the organizers of the March on Washington. And people should try to read Randolph's own speech that day. And by the way, Martin Luther King was not involved in organizing it, though he gave the speech that has become the iconic speech of the day. Now, it's also worth noting, if we go back to 1943-44, that Martin Luther King Jr. was a very young, brilliant, precocious kid. And he entered university at like 14 or 15 years of age. And he was... Uh, uh, the, the, one of the major black colleges. I'm blank. All of a sudden, I'm blanking. Down in Atlanta, not far Morehouse? from where you are. What's that? Morehouse. Morehouse. Right? Thank you very much. Yep. Morehouse. And while he was there, A. Philip Randolph came to Morehouse and did a short residency and did a series of lectures. And this was also the time, of course, of FDR's Economic Bill of Rights speech. And and King's father was very much a pro Roosevelt can't call him a Democrat, because I would imply a Southern Democrat, but he decided he, well, this was a New Deal family, okay? F, so Martin Luther King clearly is cultivating in his own mind an idea of social democracy or democratic socialism. So when we come to 1963, you've got A. Philip Randall, Martin Luther King, and Walter Ruther, as you said, UAW leader, who is literally the guy who writes the checks to underwrite the March on Washington that brought 250,000 people to DC. And here's the next thing. In the following year after that speech, and soon you get, Martin Luther King will soon after the Civil Rights Act is enacted and the voting rights, he's going to pursue the poor people's campaign. And he's also going to have issued um, um, a minority people's bill of rights call. Similarly, A. Philip Randolph issues a freedom budget and the freedom budget is a, literally a call to, make, to end poverty and make freedom from want true in America. And it includes over and over again, the imperative of full employment, basically a guaranteed right to a job. If not in private industry, then decidedly the federal government will create those jobs. Not yeah, so uh, this is, I uh, should check out the, uh, the whole interview. Uh, it's available on the uh, on the YouTube page, or you can just go, you know, you can just go listen to uh, listen to that episode. Throwback uh, to the first episode of uh, Give Them an Argument. Yeah, that's right. The uh, uh, the very first one. Um, so and uh, and also, I should uh, I should say really quick, we should do the plug before we bring Michael Albert on. 
uh, that uh, if you uh, if you want to uh, to access uh, you know every single episode, that's a public one, but also the uh, the patron ones. Just go to uh, patreon.com uh, slash Ben Burgess. Uh, and of course uh, that, that helps support everything that, you know, that we do here and, uh, and pay everybody's salary. Uh, you should, uh, you know, whatever uh, wages, you know, I guess, I guess salary makes this sound like a little bit more stable and institutional you know, than, uh, than the show is just yet. But, um, and I should also I should also mention our uh, graphic uh, graphic designer, the uh, extremely talented uh, J. Andrew World, has uh, has been making some little three panel comics with uh, with images from Pulp, Pic- Pulp Fiction uh, to uh, to advertise um, the uh, the Patreon. So I think we have just one of them uh, one of them here right now. Yeah. All right. So. Um, if you're uh, if you're listening to this later in the uh, in the audio version, uh, it's um, uh, Samuel Jackson and uh, and John Travolta in uh, Pulp Fiction. Uh, you know what they call a give them an argument with Ben Burgess in Paris? They don't call it a give them an argument with Ben Burgess. Uh, uh, no man, they got the metric system. They wouldn't know what the fuck a Ben Burgess is. So what do they call it? And then he gives the French name and whatever. And then uh, he uh, there's a little joke if you uh, if you understand french but that doesn't matter and then he says uh uh well what do they call a michael brooks show well a michael brooks show is a michael brooks show but they call it le michael brooks show le michael brooks show ha 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 what do you uh what do they call the uh, rachel maddow show i don't know i didn't watch rachel maddow <laughs> so, um anyway made me laugh i uh, appreciate the uh you know appreciated that but uh, with no further ado, I am uh, extremely excited uh, to uh, to bring on uh, Michael Albert, uh, who is the uh, the author of uh, several books, uh, notably including uh, Paracon, uh, Life After Capitalism. Uh, and I wanted to uh, to to bring him on to uh, to talk uh, about that, about his his vision of of a post capitalist society and what what that might look like. Uh, and also uh, a little bit about uh, left strategy and uh, and and how to get there. So, uh, thank you so much for coming on, Michael. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it muchly. Yeah. So, I want to uh, actually before we before we really dive into uh, to anything uh, the stuff that I I actually brought you on to uh, to talk about since I know you were in the waiting room where we were doing that previous segment uh, about Martin Luther King Day. I did want to just give you the opportunity to add anything that you wanted to add to that. Not really. I mean, I thought it was a good segment, uh, and and it honed in on the on the reality of, uh, as you put it, two phases or two parts uh, of King. Um, I was there in those times, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and. I have to be honest about it. I and people who I interacted with, for the most part, were in the streets and organizing, and you know, knocking on doors and all that. But pretty nearly uh, oblivious to King. Mm. Uh, I think. I think, insofar as I can remember, we were uh, concerned with the Panthers, concerned with the. Um, people like St- then Stokely Carmichael, um, mm-hmm. Snick in the South, uh, not as much can, uh, although he was such an excellent speaker that you would, you know, you would see snippets of it or reproductions of it, not like now you can see anything <laughs> more than you can see <laughs> then. I mean, it's sort of amazing. Um, and then you would be very moved by his eloquence and his, uh, you know, effectiveness but it wasn't um, it wasn't where I was, so to speak, in the, in the left. No, yeah, well, let's, let's, let's talk just a little bit about where you were. So, um, so what was your kind of entry point into radical politics? Well, it's it's a longer story than I think you probably want to hear. But when I went to college, I'll keep it as short as I can. When I went to college, I was. I was, you know, awakening a bit, um, listening to Bob Dylan very closely and being very moved by it. Um, But when I got to college, I I went to school in Cambridge to MIT. And of course, Noam Chomsky was there. And I was very quickly 
uh, radicalized. And um, in those days, things happened very fast. Um, you went from whatever you were to radical to a raging revolutionary. It could happen in months. It could actually happen for some people in weeks. Um, and so that happened. And uh, the, the part of the left that I was in, we talked about things like we called it the totality of oppression, and that meant racism, sexism, and classism, or economic relations, class relations. And I was pretty much from the beginning um, very dubious about uh, some approaches. Uh, Marxism, as it was being formulated at the time, being practiced by various groups, didn't hold much allure for me, even though I certainly agreed with the critique of capitalism and with the, uh, you know, the, the issue of private property being a gigantic problem, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't long before. I, I guess you would have to say I was more a part of the new left. I was more yeah. a part of the left that was concerned with the totality of oppression. Um, to get to what you want to talk about today, I think, mm. I was... I encountered, like many of my age in those times, encountered lots of people saying, I get what you don't like, you know, you, you scream that loud enough and widely enough, and I have ears and I can see, and I get that, but what do you want? And that was very commonly raised, and it was commonly raised as a kind of attack, a very intelligent attack, in which what they were doing, parents would do it with their children, and other people would do it you know, in, in other venues, faculty would do it with students. And they would basically be saying to us, you have no alternative. You don't know what you want. You have no right to be dissenting the way you are um, with the mm -hmm. militants and so on. And at first I reacted to that like many others did, you know, can you curse on the score on the show? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I mean, get fucked. You know, they would yeah. they would say that, and I would say back, you know, you don't have to have an alternative to slavery to be an abolitionist. You don't have to have a sla uh, uh, and, and on and on with examples. Right. And then again, you know, I don't have to have a complete and comprehensive alternative to capitalism to know that it is a disgusting, abysmal system. But then I decided I was wrong. And I was wrong, not because I was technically wrong, that response was a correct and response, especially coming from somebody so young. But the question was fair also, right? The question was saying, absent an alternative, you want me to take risks, you want me to, to put myself in a, in a position of opposition to people around me, maybe to my employer, and on and on. Um, and I just think you're nuts. You know, I'm not going to do that for nothing with no clarity about where we're going. And so that was when I decided, I guess, along with Robin Hanel, um, that we would at least try to do a better job of answering the question. Yeah. So just uh, just so I'm, I'm clear, because I, I think I don't really know this, like like when when is that, that the, the two of you started developing these ideas? Well, I, I guess around... 67, 68. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that was early, uh, you know, but it was it was pretty early. Robin majored in economics at Harvard and I was at MIT, but we were very close. And I distinctly remember one day in the MIT student center, there are these little rooms and we went into this little room and I said, OK, um, teach me Marxism. Um, and he did. Um, and, you know, he he explained, I think, the essence of it very clear language, in a very short period of time. And then I had my concerns with it. And so even at that stage, we were starting to question, well, what is this thing called socialism? You know, is it really, is it, is it what we see out there, which calls itself socialism and is called by the United States socialism? Or is it something else? Or do we want something else? What, what difference does the name make? What's the substance and so on? And then I guess we started, and I would say, uh, you know, the beginnings of it were, in, I don't know, maybe 69, 70. And, uh, you know, 
some years later it was it was more mature still not the full vision but it was it was getting there yeah so uh when, when you talk about what was called socialism you know what uh I, I guess back then some people called actually existing socialism back when it actually existed uh is you know the the system that that they had in you know the soviet union and other countries without you know flattening too much you know that there are you know there are differences you know between local variations of it uh but we we pretty much uh we pretty much know what we're talking about there that you know that you have a system uh with well in those cases certainly one party states uh but also with um with planned economies so there are even though there are still markets for consumer goods you know soviet citizens are still paying rubles and you know using them to buy things at stores uh, there, there are major aspects of economic activity that are are taken completely out of the market, uh, and uh, and planned by the state. And one way of being a, you know, radically democratic. Well, so certainly one way that anybody who's like an anti-Stalinist, you know, leftist would would criticize that system is that uh, is the lack of uh, of democracy. Uh, that you know we, we, we that we want things like you know free speech and multi-party elections uh you know we want them maybe even for their own sake you know because because uh, they're they're important goods uh and we uh and maybe some people also think that you know that those having those things would be um you know would be important economically but i think one kind of simple-minded way of kind of entering into like the problem that this this model participatory economics that you know you and robin Hanna are developing uh is supposed to solve is to do just a a quick little dumb thought experiment and say okay well what well, if you had basically how the soviet economy works but you layered you know parliamentary democracy onto it so you had multi-party elections and you know maybe the uh, whichever party won the election uh, that year got to appoint the head of the Soviet planning office, Gosplan, uh, and there was like a there was there was some sort of mechanism to make sure that media was relatively independent yeah. and you could say what you want, all that stuff, right? So you have free speech and you know free press and multi-party elections. Uh, that certainly would have been better, and there's no doubt that uh, certainly in my mind that some of the worst horrors of that system wouldn't have been committed by people who had to worry about. Um, about you know winning you know re-election, uh, but it's not obvious that that alone would solve uh, some of the problems that uh, that helped cause the mass discontent that helped bring down bring down that system. That they that if if you are a Soviet consumer, uh, you you know like you might have a lot of rubles in your pockets, but you, know, you go to the store and you just sort of have to hope that they they have the stuff that you want. Uh, and uh, and there's that it's it's some reasonably high quality and all of that stuff, and these things uh, might be easy from a certain perspective to to trivialize, but they're very important to people, and they're they're a big part of the reason why uh, most most pe you know Soviet citizens you know were going to defend that system, uh, you know when it uh, when it started to uh, to fall apart, and and my understanding is that participatory economic you know so. Actually, here let me let me just put it this way, and then throw it to you. So one one way, one very common way, I think, on the left, even the radical left, of uh, of trying to of like dealing with that reality that like even that version of the Soviet Union with free speech and multi party election would still have had these deep economic problems, is to say, okay, uh, well uh, maybe we do need we do need markets in certain areas in which they didn't exist in the Soviet Union. That's one very common solution. But participatory economics, as I understand it, is supposed to solve the same problem in a different way. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, but I want to go back a little bit in what you said, if I could. Yeah, please. Um, yep. and, and I think I can make the, uh, the, the point that you were raising even more stark, because some of your readers might not be too familiar with the Soviet Union. So make it the United States. Yeah. And, and make it that, um, that property is taken away from owners. And uh, so now we ha we have the the absence of capitalists, mm. uh, and now uh, retain the democratic apparatus uh, and introduce central planning. And the question becomes: Is it better 
well, very likely, um, at least as a structure, it's better. Yes, just like what you described would have been better than what the Soviet Union had. Yeah, I agree with that. Would I still be a revolutionary? Yes. Um, why? Am I nuts? Um, well, because, and there's an irony here, that, um, that Marxism says something that I don't think, which is that economics is at the bottom of everything. I, I think it's, it's more a paramount important aspect of life and sector of society, but so too is culture and, and uh, the political system and so on. Mm. But anyway, the irony is that uh, uh, many Marxists sort of follow the, the strain of thought of changing the political system in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and paying very little attention to the economy as, as a fundamentally important part and a problem. So what's the problem? Well, before we get even to the allocation system planning, there's a class problem, I think. That is, I think that the Soviet Union, it's not just state capitalism, as a lot of people would try to say. And it isn't just um, socialist economics ruined by a political apparatus. It's a new class on top, a class that was previously certainly below owners, but above workers. I call it the coordinator class. And a class has to be something that gets its position, gets its agenda, gets its self perception and its and its approach from its position in the economy and I think that's true of the coordinator class and what characterizes them isn't that they privately own means of production they don't um, it's that they monopolize empowering circumstances that their circumstances in the economy and in their preparation for it earlier in life and in education and so on but in the economy uh, gives them a situation that empowers them, that gives them information, that gives them skills, uh, that that they can use then to accrue more wealth and more, and they have more power because they are, because they are on top of the decision making apparatus. Meanwhile, workers, because I call that a separate cl working class, coordinator class, owning class, um, workers also work, also work for a wage, like coordinators under capitalism. Um, but they do work that is disempowering. They do work that reduces skills, that fragments people one from the other, that keeps you away from the levers of decision making. And their circumstances are such, therefore, that they don't play the role of participating and controlling and determining the direction of society and the economy. Now, couple that with an authoritarian state, and the of course, it's, you know, it's going to hell in a handcart. It's, it's, it's a mess. Um, so for participatory economics, in some sense, the first step, I suppose you could say, if you want to have self-management, is you have to have a mechanism by which or a venue through which workers and consumers can self-manage collectively. So that's one step. And then the next step is the work the workers and consumers have to be prepared to do so. They have to be inclined to do so. It doesn't do any good if you sort of formally have some rights, as we can see from democracy in the political sphere, if you formally have some rights, but you are denied the circumstances, the information, the skills and confidence, the time, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to use those rights. Uh, and so the first step for participatory economics is workers and consumers counsel as a, as a venue of decision making. And the second step is, um, this is going fast, but that's okay. The second step is uh, to change the way labor is organized. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's maybe pause on the first step. Uh, so okay. uh, so I, I, and I do want to, you know, I do want to make sure that we that we are going to circle back to to the uh, the efficiency you know economic efficiency problem, but uh, but when you you talk about uh, workers and and consumers councils, uh, I think that you know what you know what a workers council uh, could be. Uh, 
I, I think a lot of people have at least like a vague sense of that, you know, that, that you have uh, that, you know, management of the workplace could, you know, could be done, you know, by, uh, by some sort of, you know, democratic organ of the, uh, the people who, who work there, uh, you know, you know, in this, I mean, look, we even have under, you know, under capitalism, even in, you know, unionized workplaces, you know, you at least have, even if it, it doesn't hold power, it has to negotiate with the boss, you know, you, you do have some, you know, often not ideally democratic, but, you know, some version of that. So I, I think that a lot of people have some sense of what that means. But when you when you talk about consumer councils, uh, you know, what, what does that mean exactly? Well, that's, it's mainly for um, collective goods. So in a simple example, let's say you live in a neighborhood and one mm -hmm. of the issues isn't just, am I going to get a shirt or not? what food am I going to get, et cetera, et cetera, individual consumption choices, but a collective consumption choice, say a new park or a, a big swimming pool for the neighborhood or something like that. So it's it's collective goods versus individual goods, and collective mm -hmm. goods can occur at many levels, a neighborhood, a county, a state, um, even larger. Uh, and so the, the consumer council part of it is is making decisions about that, and the producer council is making decisions about producing and organizing work and amount and so on. And when we come to it, allocation, of course, has to have some method by which these, these entities um, as actors in the economy receive the information that they need, voice the preferences that they have, and the result gets done. You described central planning. Central planning in its simplest form is basically trivial. It's down go orders, up comes some reactions. Down go orders, perhaps slightly altered, up comes obedience. That's central planning. That's the essence of it. Markets, the essence of it is buyers and sellers compete uh, and uh, seek to improve their own circumstances in a transaction. And those who are affected beyond the transaction basically are excluded from the discussion. They're not part of the discussion. The buyer is interacting with the seller, but the others are absent. Uh, and those two definitions economists would agree to. Um, the reason I wanted to discuss the, the coordinator class stuff first is because if, you, if we ignore that discussion, I think, um, class does matter. And if we ignore that discussion, that class division becomes a schism, a rule, class rule. And anything that we're trying to do for other aspects of an economy is going to be subverted by that power differential. So if that power differential between 20% coordinator class, 80% working class, 20% empowered by their circumstances, 80% disempowered by their circumstances. If that situation is sort of, you know, arsenic for the rest of our desires, then we have to figure out the source of that. You know, why, why does that exist? And of course, People who basically like it and who would like to preserve it or are horrified about the, by the idea of trying to do away with it would say, well, it exists because that's the character of human beings. About 20% are born to participate, to play a role, to uh, engage, to be creative, and about 80% are born to do their bidding. Um, I don't think that's the case. Right. Uh, and so not thinking that's the case, you have to ask, well, how do... Why? And I mean, why does it arise? And Robin and I answered that in a way that is a little bit unusual. We said, look, it arises because the economy is structured that way, and you must enter the economy to live, to function. And what you can enter is 80% jobs that are disempowering, 20% jobs that are empowering. So then the question, well, what do you do about it? Right? How do you, what, what can you do? And so the, I think the big, perhaps the most controversial, but certainly one of the most controversial things about participatory economics is the proposal that what has to be done, if we're going to deal with this problem, uh, is to change jobs, change them in such a way that everybody's work, we don't all do the same thing. That's impossible. That's ludicrous. Okay. So that's not the solution. Uh, the solution seems to be that you change work around so that each person does a mix of things that compose a job, a viable job that the person is able to do. But that mix of things is such 
that everybody's job and and in economic circumstances is comparably empowering to everybody else's. And so you don't have people who are doing only empowering work. Let's say being a surgeon is really empowering. I don't know. I think it is, but mm -hmm. but let's say it is. So you don't have somebody who's doing only surgery and somebody else who's only cleaning bedpans. And you don't have, and now you can go on and on and on with the fifth of and the four fifths of the workforce. You'd have to reimagine work, redesign work, redesign work, so that um, people's circumstances are comparably empowering to the extent possible, equally empowering. But you can't do it, you know, to the fourteenth decimal place. That's ridiculous. But you can certainly accomplish it. And then, and then you have a different education system needed. Right in our con in our capitalist organization and in the organization of work in the old Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, basically the same. Uh, you, your your educational system has to graduate people to fit. If it graduates people that don't fit, then you have chaos in the in society. So what does it have to do? Well, it has to educate four out of every five people to endure boredom and take orders. Right. And it has to educate one out of every five people to become, you know, not quite a master of the universe in a capitalism. That's the owners. But in what has been called by many people socialism, but now I want to call it coordinatorism, uh, to become the master of the universe, that is the one-fifth who runs the economy. Okay, so, you know, if, if we don't change that, we're in trouble, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, what like this is already a place I think somebody could, uh, you know, could worry about uh, about it because you have, um, you know, like if, you know, if some people are trained as surgeons, um, you know, are you going to have to like depending on how much time they have to to spend doing you know doing less empowering tasks. Uh, then you know that you might end up having to to train you know twice as many surgeons, so you can get just as much surgery done as you would with one person being a full time surgeon. Maybe that's not a big deal, but you know that 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 is um, you know that is an obvious cost of doing things that way. There's a prior uh, a prior criticism, which is made much more often, and we might as well not skip it. Um, mm. And then and then let's address yours also, uh, because the prior one is is made much more often, and it's basically people saying, "Well, now wait a second. Uh, you're telling me that one of the people who is now in that eighty percent is might be giving me my surgery, mm -hmm. right? I don't want that. I think that the twenty percent are there because they're smarter, more capable, more creative, more industrious, and the eighty percent are where they are." Because that's the best they can do. Um, and that's a far more prevalent belief. Uh, it isn't always voiced. But even on the left, a lot of people believe that. Um, and the answer to it, well, we, there's no point in spending a lot of time on it because it doesn't appear that you're going to push that. No, <laughs> that no, no, that actually okay. wouldn't be my worry here, but, but do give okay. the answer to it. But it, it, the answer to it, I think, is, uh, is, is that the Let's do this as an example of it. If we go back 50 years, the same question arises about women as compared mm -hmm. to men or blacks as compared to whites. The exact same question. And it looks like if you examine it superficially, it's mm -hmm. valid, right? Because you see all this sector of people not doing surgery and not doing coordinator class type activities, right? Mm -hmm. and, you, and you see and, and you can explain it. And it would be an explanation if it was true, right? You can explain it by saying that's all they're capable of. Okay, so now yeah. in the case of women and blacks, we know that that was nonsense. And we know yeah. that it was a product of the circumstances and of the lives that they lead, led yeah. and of the positions that they found themselves in. And what I'm claiming is the exact same thing is true, effectively in the same way as, uh, you know, for working working class people, not not coordinator class, but working class people, their circumstances, their living conditions, their prior lives, and especially what they encounter on entering the economy produces uh, their position 
uh, their subordination. And it's not a function of a lack of capacity. The, can everybody be a surgeon? Of course not. That's ridiculous. I couldn't be. That's ridiculous. Well, so, so, so that is what I was going to say, though, uh, that it's, I, I think with, you know, I think you don't have to fall into thinking that, um, you know, that there's some sort of big picture division, you know, between, you know, four fifths and one fifth of, you know, the human race or anything like that uh, to, to think that, you know, that there are like probably most people who are born into middle-class households with lots of opportunities, et cetera. Um, I'm guessing, uh, you know, couldn't, you know, couldn't be surgeons. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe most of them could be, maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't, I don't actually, you know, having, uh, having never, uh, you know, having never been anywhere around that and not, uh, you know, not having made any attempt to, uh, you know, become any sort of doctor myself. I have no idea, but, you know, it, it sounds, I, I think it's plausible that, that most people from any class background, you know, that like there are lots of things, maybe surgery is one of them, maybe not, but there are lots of things that are uh, relatively specific, uh, you know, skills that, that do require, you know, you know, I mean, particular temperaments, you know, uh, that, you know, et cetera, uh, you know, steady hands, certainly in the case of surgery. Of course, and, 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 and that's not to say that the people who are doing them are the only people, you know, who, who could do them. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that the, I, you know, I think it's, it's certainly plausible that in a society where, you know, more people had the opportunity to pursue those specialized skills that, you know, that, that we could get, uh, you know, that we could get a much bigger, you know, that we could get a bigger pool of people. And in fact, look, I mean, even in, um, even, you know, I think we even have some country by country, you know, evidence of this, uh, that the, um, you know, that I, I know that like in Cuba, for example, the proportion of doctors to patients, uh, you know, for, for all of the problems, you know, with, with the, uh, the system there, uh, the proportion of doctors to patients is like off the charts compared to almost anywhere else in the world because, you know, because they they push it, you know, very heavily and and don't, you know, and, and certainly don't charge anybody, you know, for going to medical school. Uh, but it's not quite like it's, uh, but presumably for at least some skills, we are talking about relatively small pe pools of people to do them. I mean, maybe if we only had to. But, but to, it's not the issue. Okay. Yeah. In other yeah. words, all right, so so let's take now and, and yeah. say yeah. rough numbers, 20% coordinator class, 80% working class. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what has to happen if we're going to have a situation where virtually 100% are sufficiently prepared, sufficiently confident, sufficiently mm -hmm. skilled to participate without being sort of dwarfed by others mm -hmm. who take all the reins. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't that everybody has to be everything. Right. It's that you have to do a mix of stuff that leaves you comparably empowered. Now, 50 years ago, again, people would have said that women couldn't do it at all. Right. Somebody enlightened might have said, well, sure, some women can be surgeons, but not at a sufficient pace for what you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, women being comparable to men throughout the economy. But of course that's been proved nonsense, right? And and the reality is that that the extent to which the, the thing is a product, that, that the differences between the groups is a product, mm -hmm. is a function of the institutional structure. And all that's being said is, let's say that for the sake of discussion again, I, I don't know what figures are, nobody knows anything about right. this, but let's say that you need among the 80%, right, mm -hmm. a comparable percentage of, of people to be able to be doctors as you have among the 20%, mm -hmm. not all of whom are doctors by any means, or could mm -hmm. be, right? So right. you need that comparable percentage, and that's exactly what happens if we look at women from 50 years ago, right? The, the the probability and the likelihood and the disposition and the inclination to be a doctor among women is about the same as among men. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I think the, the likelihood, the probability, the disposition and the inclination to be, to do empowered work, mm -hmm. either doctor or, or anything else, right? Engineer, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Is going to be comparable among that 80% as it is among the 20%. Um, and I, I think that's that's valid. It doesn't have to sure. be for this to work, but I suppose for this to be, 
you know, perfect. Yeah, I mean, but but for the, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to spend too much time on on the okay. point because I, th I think there are more interesting things to get to. But I, I think that with what you're talking about, right? What I've seen you refer to elsewhere as balanced job complexes that mm -hmm. you have, you have um, that you can't have, you know, some people at the, uh, at the, you know, the workplace where brain surgery happens, you can't have some people who only do brain surgery and some people only sweep the floors. Uh, you, you have to have a mix, uh, you know, a mix of people performing, not that even at that workplace necessarily everybody has to perform brain surgery, but you have to have a mix of people performing, relatively more empowering and relatively less empowering tasks, which uh, which does mean that you would have to presumably, you know, if you don't want a, a reduction in the amount of brain surgery that's going on, you'd have to, pre, you know, train more brain surgeons sure. than uh, than you have you have right now. Uh, I, I agree with you, by the way, that 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 like, I, I think that's realistic that you could. I think that's fine. Uh, you know, I could see somebody and it's not a point I necessarily want to get too hung up on. I, I could see somebody saying, um, that it's like relatively inefficient to, you know, have to train, you know, but, uh, to train twice as many brain surgery. People do say happening. that. Yeah. So people do criticize it that way, but look at what's really being said. What's being said is it's relatively inefficient to tap the talents and capabilities of 80% of the population. That's mm -hmm. literally what's being said, right? It's more efficient to train them to endure boredom and take orders. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly what's happening, the the virtue of the approach is to keep the relatively small number of people on top, empowered, mm -hmm. and with so much power that they can take tremendous wealth. Let me just give one little story that I think sure. makes, a, makes a point. Um, yeah. I was in Argentina, and it was uh, not long after, well, actually it was six, eight months after, um, the 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 events there in which many factories were taken over by workers. Mm -hmm. And the, it wasn't taken over by and large in a kind of an upsurge, um, you know, ideological and organized and so on. It was rather that the economy was in trouble and the capitalists were punting. And when they wanted to, to punt, the workers took over the factory. And not only did that happen, but most of the, what I call coordinator class said to themselves, good Lord, the owner just left this is a disaster. I'm getting out of here too. So they yeah. left also. So the workers were left with these workplaces. Mm -hmm. And I was in a meeting with about people from about 50 of them. And I was supposed to give a talk. And so we sat around and, and we started off and people started describing their experience. Mm -hmm. And at first it was very buoyant and excited because, you know, people were meeting other people and so on. By about the, literally the seventh talker, and I started telling this a long time ago and it stayed the seventh all the time because that's what I remember what I've said. But by the seventh speaker, um, the room was maudlin, mm -hmm. really depressed. And the seventh speaker said rather eloquently, building on the sixth, I never thought I would say anything like this. But maybe Margaret Thatcher was right. Maybe there is no alternative. Mm -hmm. We took over the factory. We pretty much equalized rages. We'll talk about what I think maybe might be a little better than that in a, if you want in a while. Yeah, but please. anyway, we, we radically changed wages. Mm -hmm. We formed our workers' council. We voted. We started making decisions. And now it's six, seven, eight months later, and all the old crap is coming back. And, and they were just despondent about it. And when I spoke, I just said, you think that it's because it's built into who we are, into our nature somehow. And they sort of nodded and said, yeah, it feels like it. Uh, that's what the manager, one of them said, that's exactly what the manager told me before the manager left, who I knew. And I said, well, I don't think that's what it is. I think it's something different. When you took over, and you made the changes you did, did you change the way labor was organized, the way work was organized? And at first they didn't understand the question, not because mm -hmm. they were dumb, but because it's just never asked, right? And so I said, well, did you keep the jobs that existed before? They said, yes. I said, well, who did the books in your in your workplace? And they would say, well, somebody volunteered, sort of like Che volunteering to, you know, uh, that's a longer story. Anyway, they, they, they said, who volunteered? And they said, well, somebody volunteered and did it. And I said, and what's happened? And they said, well, you know, all the old crap's coming back. And I said, well, doesn't that mean 
that those people are taking more income for themselves, the ones who took those jobs, that those people are going to the meetings that you arranged, the workplace council that you arranged, right? And you're not, you're not going. And they said, yeah, that's right. You know, attendance is falling off dramatically and they're there. And I said, yeah, well, that's because you don't want to go to a meeting where they're the only ones who talk and where they have all the information. And when they come in and set the agenda and you're basically there being told what the outcome is going to be. They said, yeah. And so the point here is that their tremendous desire, every one of them, there's no managers left in the workplace. There's no owner. They all wanted to have essentially self-management. They mm-hmm. wanted to control their own lives, right? And they and they took steps to have it happen, but they didn't change that institutional relationship, that division of labor, and that subverted their desires. Retaining it was 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 like arsenic for their desires, it, 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 and that's how institutions work. They have implications; they really do matter, and some institutions have essentially deadly implications. So this institution, the corporate division of labor, we could call it, has this deadly implication. And there arose for us years ago when we were doing it, uh, the idea that the need for a, a different approach, balanced job complexes, wasn't some minor thing. And it wasn't some sort of peripheral thing. But it was a very, very centrally important thing, just like getting rid of private ownership of the means of production is central thing, right? If you don't do that, your other efforts are going to be subverted by retaining private ownership of the means of production. Similarly, if you don't deal with the division of labor, desires for self-management, desires for equity, other desires are going to be subverted by the retention of that and the residual effects it has and the way it it causes people to have different interests, opposed interests, class struggle, basically. So that was the second step. The third step had to do with income. I don't know whether you want to talk about that or not. That's yeah. also pretty controversial. Okay, yeah, give me the income step. Well, economists basically tell us mm-hmm. that income can be a function of a few different different phenomena. There's certain different norms for remuneration, they call it. Remuneration being what you get, uh, your income, the share it gives you, the, the, the claim mm-hmm. it gives you on the social product. That's what your income does, right? And they would say that, well, income can be based upon uh, the extent to which stuff that you own, so private property, uh, contributes to the social product, and that's called profits. And Or it can be based upon... Uh, power, bargaining power, basically you get what you can take. And that's basically what we have with a market system. And there's a real way to say, you you can even make the case that, look, that's what property is also, all right? The legal system is set up in such a way that property gives you bargaining power. Mm -hmm. So you you could make the case that it's all bargaining power, or you could say it's bargaining power and remuneration of property. A third possibility is that you get what you produce. So in other words, you get back from the social product an equivalency in terms of value of what you contribute to the social product. Okay, minus some because some goes to insurance and generalized health care and whatever else. But basically, you get in proportion to what you contribute to the social product. And that's a position that many socialists hold. Right. So a great many people who call themselves socialists, including people who call themselves socialists and don't like what they would might call 20th century socialism and, and are in fact adamantly opposed to it, but still call themselves socialists like that position. Uh, and Robin and I thought about that and decided, no, that that's neither ethical nor economically smart. Why isn't it ethical? Well, why isn't getting income for property ethical? It's because you're not, you just inherited it. Um, it's, it's like luck in who your parents were, um, that determines the property that you own, or maybe you were lucky in business and you can manage to own a ton, right? But it's rewarding ultimately luck in some, some very real sense, nothing that you should, you know, and then, then there would be the same thing with, uh, with rewarding people for what they put in because some people are luckier than others. And, uh, no, but the uh, luck includes genetic and, and how much and how much, how, 
in their their physical or mental capacities you yeah. know what they can do yeah which by the way is actually the a lot of people think that the uh, a lot of people think that what Marx advocated was uh, was having uh, this this kind of um, getting back the full product of your labor, uh, but this is uh, this is a criticism he makes of the uh, uh, the other the Lasallian faction of the German socialist movement in the uh, first chapter of the Critique of the Gotha Program. Uh, so uh, so yeah, so I, I get the. I may be wrong about this because I'm no yeah. Marx scholar, right? Yeah. I think he was mostly contributing. Is your eye okay? Uh, yeah, no, I said, I don't know. But anyway, right. don't worry about it. Yeah. So I think he was mostly uh, criticizing the um, the lack of attention to the idea that a certain amount has to go to investment, a certain amount has to go to providing medical care, a certain amount has to go to education, and so on and so forth. And then you get back in accord with your product. But but maybe he didn't. It doesn't matter what he what. Yeah, me, yeah, no, it, it, the question is what's right what's good no no fair enough uh so um there is uh just you know just for fun uh, though he, he does let me, say, let me just finish the case it'll just take another sure sure be my guest all right so so we don't want to reward luck in the genetic lottery that's one of the hard steps to, for a lot of people to take right so yeah. it shouldn't be the case that lebron james earns 40 million dollars a year yeah, he he doesn't even get his full product, his full contribution to the social product. He doesn't have enough bargaining power. Nike right. gets some of it. The owner of the team gets some of it. The TV networks get some of it. He doesn't get it all, but he gets a shitload, and way more than most any socialist would think is, has any relation to reality. And yet he's getting back less than the value of his product. You might not like that so many people like watching him play, but they do. And that's not, you know, you, you don't get to decide for everybody else what they're. Okay, so not the genetic lottery, but what about the tools lottery? You know, why should you get more because you happen to be using better tools? Because you were lucky in the tools lottery, so to speak. Or you were lucky because you're producing something that's highly valued as compared to something that's less valued, but still valued. Mm -hmm. um, or you even have better workmates. So is there a way to not reward any of that? Which, by the way, none of that has any positive incentive effect rewarding it. You know, people think that there's no positive incentive effect rewarding luck in the genetic lottery. You can't change your genetic endowment, right? You can't work to make your... So what can you, what can you remunerate? Well, it seems to me you can or remunerate how long people work, how hard they work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which they work. Mm -hmm. period. And if you remunerate those things, you're remunerating exactly what people have control over. And therefore, there's the incentive effect that you're looking for, or that people yeah, should be looking for. Clarify, by the way, you, you just use this phrase tools lottery. Uh, can you can you tell us one more time? Well, about that? Suppose, suppose the two of us go out to cut cut some kind of sugar cane or something, and you've got this fantastic scythe, and I've got a scissor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you, you produce it you know, uh, I can't, I'm not sure what your screen captures, but you produce this much and I produce this much. Yeah. But we're in the, under the same sun, we're working the same duration and we're working the same hardness. Right. Should you get twice as much income because you have a better tool? That's the kind of idea. Now, does the economy want to generate good tools? Yes. But you don't have to do that by rewarding the people who are using them. There are other ways to accomplish that goal, which is a good goal. Right, than enriching people just because they happen to be lucky using one. Or the same thing with, uh, say, uh, being a surgeon and saving lives. I mean, how much more value can you generate in three hours than mm -hmm. saving a human life, right? So yeah. so the, the value that, that the surgeon, while doing surgery, even if we have balanced job complexes, still, there are people doing surgery, the value that they're generating is enormous, and if they're getting remunerated for that, their income will be much higher. And what Robin and I are saying is, no, that's not right. What they should get remunerated for is duration, intensity, and onerousness. Uh, and um, the, the fact that the, the product is valued is essential, but the fact that it's valued is not part of what goes into determining their income. It's, it's not their income isn't in proportion to the valuation of their product. And that's yeah. very unusual. 
uh, but I think it's ethically right and it's economically right in terms of incentives. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just uh, you know, it's a it's a footnote, but just because it's a point of interest uh, in uh, this uh, in the uh, in the critique of the Goth program, Marx does make both criticisms. You know, there's the criticism about you know money going you know being needed for for new investment uh, and common needs like healthcare and education. Uh, but he also says. Oh, it's interesting, yeah. But he also sure. says that um, rewarding people for, um, uh, you know, rewarding people in proportion to what they put in uh, recognizes no class difference because everyone is a worker like everyone else, but it tacitly recognizes unequal individual endowment and thus productive capacity as a natural privilege. So um, so I, I think he does have the same, um, you know, it's it's a sort of it's a sort of point made very quickly in passing, but I think he does have the same. Well, but I'm, I'm impressed on two counts. I'm impressed that you knew it and caught it, and I'm impressed that he said it, and uh, it's helpful so, so, because it helps what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> but, it, uh, but, but but of course, Marx. The downside of what Marx is saying in critique of the Goth program, which of course is one of the only times that he talks about. Yeah. Uh, what a socialist society might look like. He's got this famous remark in uh, one of the introductions to uh, Capital about not, you know, bothering with writing recipes for the cook shops of the future. And of course, you are in the business of writing recipes for the cook shops of the future, which I like, you know, because because I think it's important for all the reasons you said earlier. So uh, I, I do want to make sure, uh, you know, there are a lot of different facets of this that you know that, that we could that we could dwell on. Uh, but I I, I do want to make sure that we get to. Um, the allocation, you know, the allocation well, issue. So, so you sort of, you know, you sort of gone through the principle about, you know, uh, sort of deciding, you know, who who within a group is entitled to how much, you know, based, you know, and what the relationship is between that and what they, they put in. Uh, but in a more general sense, uh, like somebody, a lot of what you've said so far, somebody could be, you know, some kind of, you um, you know, some kind of market socialist and agree with a lot of it. They could, you know, they, they could say you could, you, you could have, well, I mean, you, I mean, in principle it could, right. That you could have somebody, you could have somebody say, this is, you know, it's, it's out there in the logical space, whether or not anybody actually says it or not. Uh, you could have somebody say, Hey, okay. Balance, balance, balance job complexes. I understand the case for that. Uh, the, uh, having distribution, you know, uh, within it, not just be like, actually existing co-ops uh, like Mondragon where uh, wage scales are very egalitarian compared to normal businesses, but, you know, but they're still, they still pretty much work, you know, like, like they're still, um, you know, they're not anything like what you're, you know, what you're talking about. It's, it's still much closer to the way normal businesses assign wages. So I can understand having some sort of principle about how you distribute, you know, um, about who gets what wages within a cooperative that would be that would be purely about duration and intensity of labor. Again, maybe they don't say this, but they could say this. But where you, but the fundamental place where you disagree with this person that I'm describing uh, is about how it is, like what the basic mechanism is for coordinating what's produced uh, with with consumption needs, because. Um, because a market socialist, like a market anybody, right, says that the the basic mechanism for accomplishing that uh, is uh, is market pressures, uh, and that's not the basic mechanism uh, that that you want. Uh, and and so I was I was hoping that you know before we kind of get to the point where we answer some audience questions, uh, that that you could kind of take us through what's the what's what's the basic mechanism for deciding what gets produced and you know and and how that's you know how that's linked yeah. to consumer preferences okay. in the society okay um three sentences first to agree sure. with something that you said mark it's, sure. mark said um i actually agree with the point of view that we should not be creating uh i call it blueprints mm -hmm. for the future um i think our agenda has to be both morally and strategically to address, to, to think through what set of institutions are necessary and sufficient so that people in the future can decide their own circumstances, right? It's not for us to spell out everything in a blueprint, but it is for us to create the situation in which future people, hopefully not too far in the future, are self-managing themselves, not according to our, 
our preconceived notions, but according to what they are learning and their experience and their circumstances. Okay, so for so why do we have to even talk about allocation, given that that mm. limitation on what we should talk about? And the answer I think is the same as for the division of labor and for ownership relations. Own, you know, getting rid of ownership relations is a precondition for people in the future to be self-managing. Getting rid of the division of labor is a precondition for that. Uh, I wouldn't say that the remuneration norm is a precondition for that, but it certainly is an additional ethical injunction. But then we come to the allocation system. Well, why can't we use either markets or central planning? Right. So, so that comes as a first question, and because there's no point in trying to think up something new if one of them is okay. I mean, I agree with that. You know, don't 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 look for a solution where none is needed, but I think one is needed. Um, you seem more concerned about markets, so I'll spend two seconds on central sure. planning. Um, central planning is not okay because central planning is authoritarian by its intrinsic definition and because central planning creates the class division. Of course, going into central planning from capitalism, it already the class division already exists and the coordinator class is simply elevated into the dominant position. But central planning creates that because central planners are giving orders and expecting to be obeyed and they have to legitimate their authority, which they do with their so-called astuteness and intelligence and whatever, with their education. And inside the workplaces, they don't want to negotiate central planning with workers' councils of filled up with workers who are confident and aware and are going to battle them. They want to work with managers and with heads of heads of firms. So the, uh, the whole structure sort of reproduces um, the coordinated class division. I think markets do the same thing, but it's a subtle, it's, it's a different manner that they do it. Um, this is aside from the fact that markets produce rampant individualism because that's the way you get ahead in a market system. So it's perfectly rational to behave in such a fashion. In fact, you almost have no choice, right? You can't go into the store and pick something up to buy and be concerned about the well-being of the person who produced it. I mean, that's just insane. Nobody does that. You're concerned about whether the item meets your needs, so you buy it. So it produces individualism that we see all around us, a kind of a rat race society. So that's a problem with markets. Even if you get rid of private ownership, that's still a problem with markets. Even if you had balanced job complexes, that would be a problem with markets. But here's why you won't have that, I think. Um, in a market system, each firm has to compete. If a firm uh, competes horribly, competes poorly, it goes out of business. And its workforce, even if they're organized in a workers' council, even if they have democratic rights or even self-managing rights, is screwed because their income drops to nothing, right? So, so they have a need to compete. Now, inside of a workplace, competition generally means certain things. It means reducing, in this case, the benefits that are going to workers, keeping those benefits for marketing, for uh, uh, certain kinds of innovation, et cetera. It certainly precludes, if nobody else is doing it, right, mm. spending your income on daycare, on air conditioning for everybody, on, uh, uh, you know, considering whether you really want that assembly line or whether you want to reorganize work, et cetera. Um, it precludes all that because you're competing with other firms. And now how do you do that? Do you ask as a firm, what do you do? Do you have workers make the decision to screw themselves? Well, we'd be terrible about that, that decision, right? Working people are not going to be good at cutting off their own air conditioning, at allowing the fumes to flow through the factory, at speed up, at, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to be good at making those decisions. So what we need to do is to shield some people from the implications of the decisions that they're making. And we have to find people who are willing to do that. So we go to the business school and we hire uh, people who have been trained for 15 years um, or 18 years, right? 
to have a an elitist, domineering, I'm superior attitude, and to understand how to extract wealth from a workforce. And so in Yugoslavia, which had markets and which got rid of private ownership, again, we find that the workplaces look pretty much the same as they did in the Soviet Union. And it's not because it's, it's written in. In Yugoslavia, the constitution said workers control the workplaces. That was true also in the Soviet Union. It didn't make any difference, right? It, it made no difference because the structure, in one case markets and in the other case central planning, and in both cases the division of labor, which would have done it anyhow, um, imposed the outcome. Okay, so I don't like, there's one other problem, that, there are actually more, but we won't do many. But markets, there's another problem with the argument that you made about, well, somebody could accept the balanced job complexes with markets. I just tried to make a suggestion that that can't happen, that markets markets would subvert such a desire and have over and over. But the other, the other point was, well, you could remunerate in a more equitable way inside of a, inside of firms in a market economy. And the problem with that right wingers point out, they point out that if you re remove um, wages from market determination, you're, you're sort of subverting all prices, right, that are based upon wages. So everything is getting distorted and markets are no longer doing what the idealized notion of markets can accomplish. So that's the second problem. And the third problem is arguably the biggest, that markets fuck up the ecology, that markets create a tremendous incentive to dump stuff, to pollute, et cetera, et cetera, because you can make profits off that, your firm can be successful off that. So you might argue, uh, rightly, I think, that you can put constraints on markets, that you can moderate these ill effects, um, and you can, but you can't eliminate them. It's like putting constraints on private ownership or putting constraints on anything horrendous. It's still there. It's still percolating to try and get its way, and it typically does. So anyway, this led Robin and I to, you know, this is a bit abbreviated, but it basically led Robin and I to... Uh, to feel that we actually need a new, a new mode of a new way of allocating. Now, at the time, there was a guy named Alec Nove. Do you do you know his name? Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. So he argued at the time. This is at around the same time, roughly speaking. He argued, look, there really is only markets and central planning. Those are our options, and now let's to dis let's discuss which one we want. And for Robin and I, that was sort of like a parent saying to a kid, you know, there's only A and B, and the kid notices, wait a minute, what about C? I want C. Where's C? And the parent says A or B. And so Nov was saying markets are central planning, and he didn't, there's no evidence of it. There's no proof of it. There's no argument that it's impossible to do anything else. It's simply an assertion. Yeah, well, well, let's, let's talk about what the something else is. Okay, so here's the other thing. Okay, so we've said we have workers, councils, and consumers. Yeah. Okay, so now... Um, what what has to happen is a communication between them, like you pointed out earlier. There, there has to be, I mean, if there isn't, it's chaos, right? So there mm -hmm. has to be a dynamic. And if it's not markets and it's not central planning, what is it? So we thought, well, what if it was um, a process by which workers express what they want? This is roughly the way we started. Workers express what they want. Um, mm -hmm. That is what they want to produce, given the assets that they have at their disposal. Um, assets that they don't own, that it, you could think of it as they borrowed um, from from society, um, but they're administering. And consumer, so they're, they're making a proposal about what their workplace is going to do. Now, how, how can they do this off the top of their head? Well, no, they're using last year's um, numbers for what they did. They're using trends in demand for what they did, um, and they're using uh, some initial set of prices or estimates of what the valuation is. Now, what about the consumer side? Well, on the consumer side, the consumers are doing essentially the same thing. They are workers, or they can't work and they have a full income, but in any case, they have an income, right, each mm -hmm. of them. And so they have a budget, and they can't consume beyond their budget, but uh, up to their budget, they can, they can make a consumption proposal. 
and that's basically a proposal about what they want to consume and add it up for the consumers council it's more of a collective proposal and add it up across all of society it's basically people saying what they want and so, over here, people saying what they're willing to offer now these things aren't going to match right. right and they shouldn't match we don't want them to match right off because we want workers to be saying really what they want to do right what they think would be good to do what they think and we want consumers to say what they would like to get and they both know that you know pie in the sky is silly but they shouldn't be so trying to accommodate the final result that they're not saying what they want so they're going to be different supply is going to be less than demand i mean yeah supply is going to be less than demand mm -hmm. at the beginning okay so now what can the next step be it would have to be some process again by which the supply proposals the workers proposals are conveyed the consumers proposals are conveyed conveyed where well the workers proposals have to be conveyed to the consumers the consumers proposals have to be conveyed to the workers and in between it's nice it's actually not essential but it facilitates things to have what we call a iteration facilitation board it's probably a bad name uh iteration one round of planning after another after another that's iterations so, it, so, you've, it, so you've got some kind of complex negotiation between uh the workers councils and the, and the consumer councils um, well, here, here's where it gets a little tricky you could right okay so you might so a participatory economy might include um First, it would include the process. So the process is the workers all make a proposal, the consumers make a proposal, the uh, proposals are looked at, and in light of various algorithms, it can even be done by automatically, right? There is a new estimate for prices, and there is an indication of supply and demand of the, of the discrepancies, and the proposal goes back to the workers and consumers. Nobody else is ever making a decision, right? Mm -hmm. And the workers in the workplace now modify their proposal and the consumers modify their proposal. Now, why do they modify? They modify because part of participatory planning is you, you need to arrive at a plan. And when you arrive at your plan, it's because the proposals are accepted. And their proposals are accepted if, if the workers' proposals are socially responsible, they can be accepted. But if they're not, they won't be. And if the consumers' proposals are socially responsible, meaning they don't exceed their budget, um with with the prices as they're emerging right then they can be accepted uh and i mean uh, you know there's details but but basically what's being said is if you do these rounds of of activity of proposals and responses including um reacting before the next round of proposals to the responses by changing the indicative prices, it's called by economists, the estimate of what final prices will be. Final prices is after you finish the whole thing um, to, to inform uh, people's next round of proposals. So you could do that. And I think we've pretty much proved that you can do that without intervention and without discussion um, and still arrive at a plan Right, you know, and you have discussion inside the workers' council and inside the consumers' council, but without, you know, endless meetings or anything like that. And and you arrive at a plan, and and when the plan is arrived at, the activities of the workplaces are in fact socially responsible. Uh, the social benefits equal the social costs, but in, in any case, you know, they're. they're there's more details, but oh, okay. So, so, so this, so this is all about the process by which the plans that the workers' councils come up with, and the plans the consumers' councils come up with. That's the most that, streamlined process. You don't have that, to do that. You could change it some, but that's the most streamlined, I guess, simple, and so, non non debating, non discussing process. Yeah. So. Um, do have a couple of questions about this. Also, want to uh, bring our producer Forrest on because I know there's at least one question from uh, from the audience we wanted to to get to, and, and I think this would be a natural place to uh, uh, to throw it in. Uh, but uh, but before we we get to that question, let's let's just kind of um, you know when you're talking about you know cons like not individual consumers, but you know consumer councils coming up with. Um, you know, with his plans, 
then I guess one obvious question is, all right, so I am a consumer in the society. Um, you know, who else is in this consumer council with me and how much do I have to, uh, like, like how much do I have to inform people however long the plan is for a year in advance maybe? Uh, how, how, much, how much do I have to know at that point? How much do I have to tell them? How much do I have to get other people to go along with uh, whatever I, you know, whatever I consume, you know, I want to consume for the next year? Because I think this is, uh, I think this is like an obvious place that somebody could have sure. have, have, a, have a worry about this because, you know, you, you sort of go with that, like Michael Walzer phrase about like how one of the ways of understanding the ethical case for socialism is to say what touches all should be decided by all. But the converse of that would presumably be that, you know, what, you know, what touches, what doesn't touch other people, right, you know, shouldn't be uh, just, you know, decided right. by other people that we think if, if what I'm consuming yeah. or not consuming isn't really hurting anybody, it's not really, you know, it's it's not and really shouldn't be up to anyone else. Right. It, it, it certainly shouldn't be decided by anybody else. It does affect people. If I, if I consume X, what goes into X is not being used for anything else, including something that you might want. So people are affected, you know, that's true. But marginally so, smallly so, although in some, considerably so. So a real al an allocation system that sort of meets our values would have to convey to that to the the, the whole array of people affected, right? The influence that's proportional. What we call self management is you have a say in decisions and proportional to the degree you're affected. Mm -hmm. So each person would have a very low say regarding your. A very low influence regarding whether you want to get a shirt or not, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it might be. But all together, there is some impact. Well, the impact of them all together is conveyed through through the price, which is changing during the planning process, and which is affecting my choice of whether or not to get a shirt. But the thing that you were asking before that was, there's there's my individual consumption, and I'm not consulting anybody about that. That I, I'm just making a proposal for what I want to consume. And it's not a proposal for every single item I want to pursue because most things are categories, right? I don't have to say what size shirt I want. I don't have to say what kind of shirt I want. Nothing like that. Just shirts. Um, whatever it turns out to be, it's going to be categories because, you know, statistical rules tell us, tell the workers what to do. It's, that's the same as now, right? That's exactly, <laughs> I saw that too. Um, that's the same as now. Looks fine to me. Uh, that's the same as now. Um, uh, you know, uh, somebody said that uh, Amazon has millions of products. Mm -hmm. so how, if, how the hell do they do what they're doing? Well, a lot of it is sort of statistical, right? They, they know if the demand is X for a kind, a category, they know roughly what everything will be under that category. And they're not always right. And neither would participatory economics be always right. But the point is, you're right about the collective goods, though. So uh, in a consumer council, if, the, if it's a neighborhood, and it would typically be different levels, right? In other, so in other words, there's the individual, there's the family, um, and then there's probably the neighborhood. I mean, this is all in the future. But sure. I would imagine, you can guess, there would be a neighborhood, and then there'd be a larger, uh, which is basically a federation of the councils within it, right, and so on. And, uh, you know, for collective goods that are consumed fundamentally by some array of people, that's the array of, of councils that would be involved in proposing it. It takes away from your individual budget, right? So, in other words, you're, let's take... The, you know, 10,000 people in some county or something. And let's say we all have average income. Mm -hmm. So we have 10,000 times the average income. And then we mm -hmm. decide to put in a pool, a giant pool. Okay, so now we have, we don't have the average income for our own individual consumption because we've just used, all of us have used some of it for the collective consumption. Mm -hmm. so that's the way that works. And uh, uh, so, so, so the question ultimately becomes, yeah. I think, uh -huh. can this approach with with variation, so for instance, one kind of variation is when when proposals sharply deviate 
I think this makes sense. Um, Robin doesn't so much. When, when proposals sharply deviate, instead of just proceeding through the pretty mechanical formulation of planning that I described, uh -huh. we could have the court, we could have the uh, uh, the workers' councils or the industry council. It would more often be right. Um, ask what the hell is the reason for that, and if it turned out that there was a really good reason for this really odd change, right? The thing the 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 new proposal by the workers would move faster than it would move in the absence of that of that information. See what I'm saying? And so you could have more or less of that. Um, you, you, you can sure, imagine sure, doing sure. this. So, so, so I mean, all, yeah. So, I mean, everything you're saying right now is about how the, how the plans are coordinated with, you know, with each other, you know, to, uh, to arrive at the, uh, at the final plan. Uh, but one, like, like one, just really basic question. All right, so you said there, there's still, uh, there's still, pro you know, you're talking about prices, so there's, there's still currency, something like currency. It could all be cyber, but it, this could have been done a hundred years ago, and it would be currency. Okay, uh, but in as part of the initial consumer plans, you know, in my neighborhood, you know, consumer council, for example. Uh, I, I don't have to decide in advance, you know, the uh, the shirts I want for that year, but I, I do have to say I want such and such budget for shirts, something like that. Well, you, you propose that, and at the end of the planning period, that's what you've planned, but now you don't have to stick to what you did, right? Why not? Well, because lots of people aren't going to stick. Some are going to go up and some are going to go down. Some are going to switch this way. Some are going to switch that way. A lot will average out and cause no problem. But let's say that, uh, I don't know, uh, something occurs which causes a shift from what was planned to wanting much more of something. Okay, so you accommodate that. Uh, the, the Workers' Federation has to accommodate that. That requires more inputs, et cetera, et cetera. But the prices of all this stuff are... Um, determined by the plan, and the decision to do it is determined by the people. There is no, there's no owner. There's, there's also no coordinator class, right? It's not a market. A lot of people will say, well, but Michael, this is, this is a market, isn't it? No, because the, the actors in this are not bartering with each other with bargaining power, right? They're making proposals and making decisions, and what's more we claim um, hadn't been proved yet. Well, we think it has been proved, but it certainly hasn't been agreed to as yet that the prices that emerge from this kind of participatory planning system, right, can reflect not only consumer preferences and not only worker preferences, uh, but ecological effects, but externalities. Um, and now it's another layer of the planning process, but you can actually incorporate and account for the ecological and social effects of activities and not just the personal effects. Um, and that's a gigantic difference. Uh, okay. It's probably so, the difference between living and dying, but. Okay. All right. So, uh, so Forrest, uh, I want to give us the uh, audience question, which, which I think was one that, um, that I, I think there was at least in a, in a glancing way, you know, Michael touched on a little bit earlier, but you know, but it, yeah. it, one of the most common questions. All right. So uh, will too many meetings be a thing under Paracon or any form of socialism? And is, is this a legitimate criticism? And it comes back to that uh, discussion you had last week with Thaddeus Russell, where he was saying that too many meetings was his big problem with socialism. Ah, yeah. Um, okay. So that, remember I said a little while ago, you could have the streamlined version of the planning or you could have a version of the planning which incorporates a degree of qualitative exchange of information, not prices and requests, but qualitative information behind that. Well, that's an example of one of the ways that you could have more or less meeting time. Now, the thing is, in participatory uh, economics, the work of planning is work. It's part of your job for everyone. So it's not as if what you're doing is piling on top of your workload, right? Um, that kind of activity. There's something very striking about, it's a little like what we said earlier, uh, you know, if you have to chain more doctors, isn't that a 
sort of a problem. Well, viewed one way, it is, but then viewed another way, it's releasing the capacities and the abilities of 80% of the population. Um, so it's not a problem. And also, it depends what you value, right? So if, if we value solidarity, for example, if we value human participation, even if it did take longer, right, to do participatory planning than it takes to function in a market system, let's say, uh, uh, this would be a price I would be willing to pay, that extra time for solidarity, for classlessness, for equity, and so on. But I don't think it does take longer because a lot of things also are diminished, right? A lot of things that take time are reduced. So, for instance, class struggle is reduced. Um, struggling to get by is eliminated. Uh, um, you know, the IRS, uh, you know, these kinds of things are no longer functional in a participatory society. So you see that many things are removed and some things are added. And if we pay attention to both, um, we get a a fuller picture. But anyway, I, you could do participatory economics with the only meetings being, the only economically related meetings being, um, except in the case of a crisis like, say, COVID, mm -hmm. um, the only meetings would be sort of uh, workers uh, at the beginning of the year deciding the, um, the, the definition of the jobs in their workplaces to have balanced job complexes. And workers uh, uh, apportioning income. Um, we didn't talk much about how you actually do that, how you actually receive income for duration, intensity, and onerousness. Uh, but essentially no meetings for, um, you could literally have no meetings uh, for planning. You could literally have each worker in the workplace enter their own personal preference right? The way I described it. And likewise for all the consumers. And the workers' preferences would become over time with the planning process, and not that long either, a plan for the factory. And the consumers would become a plan for the community. But okay. it's, it's a ridiculous well, choice, I think. You should have talking inside the workers' council, and you should have talking inside the consumers. Um, well, 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 yeah, because I, I think if, if you don't have talking I'm, I'm a little unclear like so if if the like it like if there's no talking within you know if there are no meetings uh to decide you know to to decide what the total the neighborhood consumption you know council uh proposal is well, then, for the collective one you absolutely have to have it okay i, I agree um, so and 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 not even just for for collective needs like you know building the new you know swing for the playground or whatever but uh but also uh but also even like you know you you said earlier that you know people are allowed to you know input into things to the effect extent that it affects them uh you know consumption requests individual consumption requests do affect other people a little bit uh because because they don't you know because things are used resources are used right. to produce those things that could be used to produce other things so i i think this both gets at the uh the the too many meetings worry and also at the um at a kind of like privacy and individual autonomy worry uh that you know to to what ex you know to what extent are uh are you know, my neighbors, um, you know, sort of in a position to, uh, to, you know, express, you know, express opinions, uh, you know, this, this is a pretty cheap shirt, but you know, in that, you know, in, <laughs> in this hypothetical, right. You know, that's like, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like, man, bet, bet is asking for, for a lot, you know, for a big shirt, you know, shirt budget here. That seems like more than he really needs for shirts. Uh, but, as, that would oh, not really, okay. but take a different case, take a different okay. case. Suppose, First of all, you could have all the proposals be anonymous, right? So that just disappears it, right? There's, there's no particular reason why the proposals have to be attached to a name. But suppose we did attach them to a name. Some participatory economy and some country attaches them to a name. So you make a proposal, not for a lot of shirts. That wouldn't, uh, you know, that's not going to even raise any eyebrows. But for, um, you know, uh, uh, um, a lot of weapons, or even a ridiculous amount of alcohol, mm -hmm. right? Um, something, something which truly does have potentially, one doesn't mm -hmm. know what the reason is yet, but potentially mm -hmm. um, a bad side uh, mm -hmm. and a side that affects others. 
Well, under those circumstances, I think it's perfectly reasonable that the community gets to ask, why the fuck are you ordering a tank? Or whatever <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah, well, so, and so, can so, intervene. So I, I, I get, I get, I mean, I'm with you on the tank, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I do, but I think the alcohol example is interesting uh, because, uh, it, you know, I mean, if the suggestion is, is that, you know, I mean, I understand, uh, you know, once, once you spill over into, uh, into alcoholism, you know, then, then you could have like legitimate community interventions, but, but look, uh, there is wild discrepancies, uh, between different groups of people right. about what they would consider right. to be a ridiculous amount of, of alcohol. Course. Of course. Uh, and so, but first of all, remember, we're talking about people, not now we're talking about people in a society that's classless mm -hmm. and that, uh, and where everybody has has training and circumstances which empower them, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's a factor. But the other okay. factor is and even among middle just, class people, there with their yeah, absolutely, people absolutely, I agree. I agree. I agree. Uh, but but there's no reason why you can't have uh, rules, laws, right? Just like we do now, right? Except that they would hopefully be better, right? So you can have you know standards, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, that that have to be abided, so to speak. That's an interesting thing about participatory econo economics. The political system making a rule. You, you can't uh, kill um, a deer, or okay. or um, you can't buy a gun uh, mm -hmm. or a tank or whatever the rule happens to be. If the population passes a rule. It in no way distorts the behavior of the economy. Right? How would it, wait? How would the rules be decided upon, like directly well, through direct that's democracy? A political system, kind, or but but I mean those things are kind of linked together. I'm I'm just yeah. curious because that wasn't clearly. So, so there's so, something called participatory politics that has been put forward. Um, you could invite Steve Shalom onto the phone onto the show at some point. He was the original sort of main author of that. It's not as developed in some sense, I suppose you could say, is participatory economics, but that's because economics is sort of simpler in some ways, and so you can pin it down more. But so, anyway, uh, so, his, so, his so notion you, you involves... Participatory, huh? What? So, so just to be clear, right, I mean, like, um, I mean, I actually, so I don't want to go down a huge rabbit hole about this right now, but is, uh, but... But I think even a lot of the aspects of, of participatory economics that you're describing do raise some questions about the state uh, because, uh, you know, it. Absolutely. It, yeah, because 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 it seems like uh, like some of, you know, some of these rules, uh, you know, you're, you're not, um, you know, on the face of it, you wouldn't think that you get universal buy-in, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, even if you have very widespread popular democratic buy-in, it's not universal. Uh, and so there is, I mean, I could see saying that participatory economics could be combined with maybe like a plurality of possible political setups. Uh, but, you know, but, but there, but there is a question about like, do you have, uh, you know, do you have a big bureaucracy that's like, you know, making sure that like every, uh, well, that every individual workplace has balanced God job complexes, for example, that they're really meeting the, those requirements and, and if you don't, right? How realistic is it to to think that you're ending up with that? Okay. So there's two there's two different um, ways of tackling the question that you're asking. One is during transition. I mean, that is uh, this thing isn't deposited on Earth by Zeus in finished form or whoever, right? In finished form. And so, yes, there's a period of time we have no idea how long during which there's a big struggle and uh, some workplaces are maybe participatory economic and some aren't and so on and so forth. And then there's the situation of when the system is established, which is a very different situation, I think, because when that situation arises, uh, pretty much everything is participatory economic in the economy. And uh, there won't be anybody who wants to, or would even contemplate working in a workplace that was run by a person that was owned by somebody. You, do, you wouldn't even have to outlaw it, right? Like you sort, you, you, you almost don't have to outlaw slavery now in the United States, 
right? It's not, because why? Because who the fuck's going to submit to that when you can, you know, be a wage slave, which is mm-hmm. a hair better. Um, so, but in the transition period, I agree with you, and I have no idea. That is to say, we can all hypothesize what kinds of uh, intermediate stages we go through. I mean, we have markets. They're not going to disappear overnight, right? So participatory economics in the short run, I think, would, if it was adopted by people, if, if people felt it was valid and worthy, mm-hmm. it would lead to significant short run changes. Like, for instance, suppose we're fighting for a higher minimum wage. Mm-hmm. Um, what's What would be different about somebody who's an advocate of participatory economics fighting for that and somebody else who might fight for that? And I think the answer is the advocate of participatory economics would be trying to move via that process, not only to establishing a new minimum wage, but Mm -hmm. also to raising desires for equitable remuneration. So imagine there was a campaign at at a college campus for a minimum wage that would be for, you know, the, uh, I don't know, the custodial staff, the people who clean up, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say they're being paid and maybe some other sectors of the workplace on the campus are being paid below minimum wage. So there's a $15 minimum wage campaign. Mm -hmm. Well, if I was part of that campaign, I would be fighting like hell to win it. But I would also be asking, why do the professors earn more than the people who clean up the room that the professors teach in? Mm -hmm. Right. And I would be asked and and on and on with questions of that sort to try and cause it to be the case when the campaign is won, people don't go home as if that's the end. That's all you can do. But instead, people now fight for twenty five dollars an hour or they even fight to begin to change the structure. So the way this vision would help in the short run, I think, is by on the one hand, allowing us to answer the question, what do you want much more compellingly and in a way that might inspire more hope and support simultaneously, and also helping to guide us in immediate campaigns in ways that would turn, that would cause those campaigns to be consistent with trying to win a new, new economy instead of consistent with just trying to reform this one. Um, not just because we say we want a new economy, but because we're we're pointing out along the way what it is that would be new, what it is that would really matter, um, et cetera, et cetera. So to your question, what role would the polity play in the short term? Well, you know, suppose, su- suppose Sanders won. Mm-hmm. Um, so if Sanders won and if as he made evident, popular support was militant and aroused, he could do a lot. He could affect the distribution of wealth. He could affect the attention to ecological concerns. He could institute uh, um, laws and practices that would strengthen unions and strengthen workers' organization and maybe in time workers' councils and so on and so forth. And that would all be terrific Um, and certainly something that I would I would advocate, but but when you, a revolution is changing the basic underlying defining institutions of society. It's not violence or nonviolence. It's not fast or slow. It's rather changing those basic institutions, those defining institutions. So for the economy, the change is no more private ownership, participatory planning instead of markets or central planning, balanced job plans instead of corporate division of labor and equitable remuneration. Or at least that's what we're saying it ought to be. We think that's enough and would accomplish the goal of a classless, desirable, worthy economy. So then if you have a vision for polity, for political system, and you have a vision for, let's call it kinship, um, the way people live in their private lives and and the, the formation of of education and so on and so forth and you have a vision for culture and for community relations among among different communities like race and ethnicity and so on then you have a vision for all of society and if we had that i think it would enable us to have movements that aren't siloed 
and that aren't that fight for reforms but are not reformist um, because they're trying to change the whole society. Um, I guess I guess my concern would be how do you uh, get those things to be separate? Like if there's if there's a like how do you get those things to be separate? Like if there's separate. a political system that's somehow completely separate from a participatory economic system, I I don't like I don't to I mean I guess this is more of a hypothetical thing, but how to stop the state from kind of slowly pushing back into the economy over time. But it's it's not separate completely. Um, all right, so the political system is what? It's legislation, rulemaking, lawmaking. It's what's called the executive part. So the CDC, uh, the Center for Disease Control, that's part of the, of the government. That's the executive, and so is the police, and so on and so forth. Sure. That's executive, and there's judicial, right? There's, so those functions are different from production, allocation, and consumption, which is the economy. Um, but but they're not separate in a different sense, which is that the, the political system includes jobs, and they would be balanced. And it includes remuneration, and it would be equitable. And to the extent that it uses inputs and outputs, it would be part of participatory planning. And uh, there's no, there's a sense in which, I mean, your question is, incredibly powerful in the sense that each of these things could be viewed separately but in a very real sense they're each schools for the other or against the other in other words if we did you're right um a good economy and we leave the political system and we leave you know structural racism and we leave patriarchy then those systems are going to militate against the economy and vice versa because after all, this economy is certainly not going to treat women differently than men. Or I, I mean, it doesn't even have a concept that will allow that, right? Because there are no positions that, right? So it's just, imp but it would be at odds, right? Th they would be at odds. And if the state was some kind of dictatorial mess or something, that would be at odds also. So it is a, a comprehensive change. Um, and that's why I think ultimately we need in the vision for all of us that will allow us to have movements that are defined ultimately by the whole, that, that whole desired new society in which people might focus on race or on class or on gender because it affects them the most or it just interests them the most or something. But it would be one big movement that elevates all those things to comparable importance actually to equal importance. There's no reason to hierarchize them in any way at all. Uh, and that would overcome some of our problems too. Uh, all right. the, the, the quick picture of the political system isn't hard, I don't think. It's basically um, uh, assemblies, which could be the consumer councils could double as an assembly, right? Um, which are federated upwards. If you had uh, if you had 20 people in each assembly at every level, this is going to probably be hard to believe without doing the math, seven or eight levels are enough to cover the whole population, right? Um, where it's federated to the top, and then you can have dynamics for how stuff is decided, either at the base of it or at a different level of it with with representatives and so on and so forth. I don't want to go through it all. It wasn't our big topic. But you can think about it and come up with stuff. Um, sometimes yeah. people ask, would you have police? Yeah, right? a good and question. Then they go, and then they go berserk when I say yes. That is to say, the function, the valuable function, not the crappy functions, the valuable function of intervening and aiding in cases of... Um, you know, violation of society, violation of people's lives is a real function. And it's a function that when people say, well, all right, so then let's let everybody do that. Everybody will police. Well, nobody says everybody should be airplane pilots. Why not? Because you can't teach everybody to be an airplane pilot. Well, police, whatever you want to call them, the people who are doing this function need to be very well trained and they need to be um, overseen and they need to have community control, whatever all the things are that it's decided are, are needed. Um, uh, but 
but the the solution isn't to say well Hannibal Lecter won't exist right nobody will do any of this kind of stuff yeah, nobody right. will get drunk and beat up anybody else very nobody very convenient to just I, it's yeah it's like just assume yourself to the assumption that none of that will happen exactly assume everybody's perfect and now let's describe a, a society well it gets pretty easy when you when you assume away every conceivable problem yeah no, I'm, I'm, I'm still do that. with you on the uh, on that last part. Yeah. Um, although I guess I guess to uh, I guess to be clear, right? The uh, there would there would be people who'd be trained to do this, but they'd still have to spend part of their day uh, sweeping up the police yeah. stations for the balanced uh, yeah. job complex. And their income would be equitable. Fair enough. All right. Uh, thank you, Michael. We could go on and on and on, uh, and, uh, and and we could do several days of this pretty happily. But uh, but uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll call it there. Uh, we'll call it there for tonight. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is uh, Michael Albert, who is the uh, the author, uh, among several other things, of uh, Paracon, uh, uh, life uh, life after uh, life after capitalism. Uh, is there uh, is there anything else? Uh, you yeah. Like to can I yep. do a little plug? Please, please. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, I work at Znet, which I helped found, so that it would be nice if people want to take a look at that. You can find out more about the kinds of things I'm saying. But also, I do a podcast huh, called Revolution Z, and it's very much about vision and strategy, all kinds of vision, all kinds of strategy. There's a lot of participatory economics, but there's also a lot of other stuff. And, uh, you know, that might be something worth listening to. It's... Uh, you can find it by going to Znet, um, uh, and uh, there's links to it, etc. And it's on all the, it's on Apple and Spotify and all the rest of the things. All right, very good. All right, well, uh, thank you so much, Michael. That's remarkable the way he does that so fast. <laughs> <laughs> right, special skills. All right, talk to you soon. Okay, thanks a lot. All right. Uh, that was uh, was Michael Albert uh, from uh, from Znet uh, and the uh, the author of Paracon and uh, in various other books, uh, giving us some of those uh, recipes for uh, for the cookshops of the future, uh, which 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 I have to say, uh, you know, even though the uh, the part about the um, uh, you know the part about other people in, in, in my neighborhood getting to uh, regulate my alcohol consumption made me a little nervous, but you know, I think there are a lot of interesting ideas there. <laughs> uh, but um, I guess uh, I guess one thing is it would incentivize people to uh, I guess move to more liberal in the sense of tolerant neighborhoods than right, right, right. In, in, in the current moment because you wouldn't want to live in a puritanical neighborhood in, in that society. Right. Oh, uh, so, um, David, uh, hey. uh, what neighborhood are you in right now? Uh, I'm back in the East Coast uh, for a couple months before I pack everything up and uh, ship on down to Texas. Oh, yeah, right. I recognize the poster behind you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How are y'all doing? Ah, uh, we, uh, yeah, I think I think we're pretty, uh, you know, we're pretty good. I spent a good um, uh I think I spent a good hour uh, yesterday, so uh, yeah, I had to go do a curbside pickup, uh, grocery, uh, you know, like grocery mm -hmm. pickup, and uh, and literally it it took about an hour to uh, to dig the car out, so I could like I could get oh, out Jesus, of the driveway. Yeah. That was so ridiculous up here right now, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's that's how I'm doing. Couldn't be me, man. I gotta say, <laughs> good on you. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, well. Uh, so for uh, outlaws and uh, and revolutionaries this week, uh, we are uh, going to uh, to talk about this dude who is uh, who's a little bit of uh, of each of them, and I think we can get away with this uh, with uh, copyright. This is just the spoken word introduction. So let's uh, let's do this. Oh hell yeah! Oh. Well, down in Nicaragua, the Sandinistas finally overthrew the uh, 
brutal dictatorship of Somoza, who was supported for some 30 years by the United States again. And uh, at the celebration of, the, of their victory after the United States started responding to that by mining roads and killing farmers and blowing up hospitals and schools full of children. But the Sandinistas were victorious and stood up to the United States and stood them down. And Daniel Ortega, the president, asked me to sing this song at their celebration. And I'll sing it for you. All right. And we really do need to cut off there or else YouTube is going to get upset. But <laughs> uh, tell us about this guy. Oh, man. I mean, that's such a great introduction to Chris Christopherson. And um, I'm really happy to be able to talk about him, one, just because of his music. And two, actually, I really don't think people, uh, at least in my generation, realize how much of a political radical he was. But, uh, you know, that introduction right there uh, really hits at it. But, you know, Chris Christopherson is when you think country music, you have to think Chris. I mean, he was definitely one of the greats, uh, you know, good friends with all of the, you know, the characters that we know and love, Waylon Jennings. Johnny Cash, you know, he was one of the people watching John Prine as John Prine was just sort of making a name for himself. Um, just the real deal, really embedded into country music. Um, but, you know, his life is real interesting. Uh, he was born in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, dad was of uh, Swedish descent. And his daddy was actually a member of the U.S. Army Air Corps. So he traveled around a lot as a young, as a young man. Um, he went to college in California. And this is a rare thing in country music, but uh, he actually ended up earning a Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, so he went to Oxford <laughs> to study the literature. Uh, w when he was in Oxford, he's a champion boxer. Uh, he wanted to be a novelist. Um, he tried to get going to music in the UK, actually. Something like, oh man, I can't remember the name of it, like a Yank Abroad or something like that uh, was the name of his outfit, but it never <laughs> didn't really take off. Uh, um, so after that, he joins the army and he was a helicopter pilot, served in Germany. And after his tour ended, he got an assignment to teach English at West Point, but he turned it down. And his daddy and his mother disowned him for it because being in the military was such a big part of that family ethos that they felt it was just unforgivable that their son would turn his back on the military. Um, you know, so that's just like, you know, part of his background that he lived all over. Uh, the country and also in the Pacific too, as a young man, you know, so we saw a lot of different things, but before we get too wrapped up in the story, like the man could just write a song. Uh, one of his really famous songs is a song called Bobby McGee, um, where the chorus, I just love it so much is uh, freedom's just another word for nothing less left to lose. Nothing ain't worth nothing, but it's free. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling good was easy. Lord, when Bobby sang the blues, feeling good was good enough for me. Uh, good enough for me and Bobby McGee. And for people who are familiar with that song, because that's one of his most famous ones, they might not know that, you know, Bobby McGee is a woman. <laughs> um, and it's a kind of gender neutral name, which is why it's been uh, covered by so many different artists. But it's a, <laughs> it was one of those songs where he actually got the call from one of his, uh, his agents, just like in the middle of the night, like I have a song. Uh, and I think the hook needs to be a love song named somebody Bobby McGee. But then later in the song, you realize that it's a woman. <laughs> and then he wrote the song afterwards. But, um, you know, so after after working in uh, uh, in the military, uh, he went to Nashville trying to make it as a singer songwriter. Um, wasn't making any money whatsoever. So he took a gig with the National Guard and he started flying helicopters uh, to oil rigs up and through South Louisiana where he wrote a lot of these songs that later made him famous. Um, you know, but he was in the scene. He was playing at different clubs and stuff, and he was always trying to make a name for himself. And one of his main targets was, you know, the great uh, Johnny Cash, who Chris had met several times, and he would hand his demos to. And according to Johnny Cash, Johnny would just throw him in the river, just throw him in the trash. <laughs> like, what's it going to – I'm sure he was getting, you know, hundreds of tapes from random strangers on the street all the time. Um, but Chris <laughs> didn't give up and uh, – one day uh, when he was doing training, uh, flying his helicopter around, uh, he flew his helicopter and landed it in the front lawn of Johnny Cash's house. <laughs> Parks the helicopter, gets out and hands him a demo and says, God damn it, you got to listen to this song. <laughs> um, 
which Johnny ended up doing. And uh, he ended up seeing uh, this song that brought uh, Chris Christopherson to, to fame, which is Sunday Morning Coming Down, which is, if you're a drinker, this is a song that you will relate, relate to deeply. Um, it's basically a song about walking around town Sunday morning, walking around. There's no way to hold your head that doesn't hurt. Uh, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> um, you know, just sort of trying to find some peace for yourself. And like, here's a couple of lines from it. It's like, um, and then I crossed empty, I crossed the empty street and caught the Sunday smell of someone frying chicken and took me back to something that I'd lost somehow somewhere along the way on the Sunday morning sidewalk, wishing Lord that I was stoned. Cause there's something in a Sunday that makes a body feel alone. There ain't nothing short of dying half as lonesome as the sound on the sleeping little sidewalks Sunday morning coming down. And you can tell that one, he had a, <laughs> a wealth of experience, right. um, but also a really a, a writer's that's a writer's prose. Like yeah. he understood um, really deeply how to write a song to set a scene and to make you feel uh, the Sandinista the song that Ben was playing earlier is a perfect example of that too. You know, Santa Nista, you can hold your head up high. You have given back their freedom. You have lived up to your name. Santa Nista, may your spirit never die. Hold the candle to the darkness. You're the keeper of the flame. <laughs> but it's just so, you know, it's just so awesome that he has this kind of radical background. It wasn't just the Santa Nistas um, either, you know, a big time fighter for um, and believer in the American Indian movement, longtime supporter of Leonard Peltier, along with uh, Willie Nelson. Um, some personal other favorite songs of his is To Beat the Devil. Um, he's talked about sort of being down and out, trying to make money. He ends up in a bar. Uh, he says, my thirsty wanted whiskey, but my hunger wanted beans. It had been, been a month of paydays since I had heard the eagle scream. So with a stomach full of empty and a pocket full of dreams, I left my pride and stepped inside a bar. Actually, I guess you'd call it a tavern. And in that bar, he meets a, um, a character you later find out is the devil um, who sings him a song about being a broke down uh, songwriter. <laughs> um, and uh, ba and basically like the line from the devil is like, if you waste your time of talking to the people who don't listen to the things you are saying, who do you think is going to hear? And it's basically, it's a song of like defeat and depression and giving, you know, saying like, why are you wasting your time trying to convince people about their, their condition? Um, and uh, Chris Christopherson ends up beating the devil by stealing a song and flipping the words um, by saying, and you can still hear me singing to the people who don't listen to the things that I am saying, praying someone's going to hear. And I guess I'll die explaining how the things that they complain about are the things they could be changing, hoping someone's going to care. <laughs> um, which I think is a really honestly important uh, message for today, man, because yeah. it's really easy to get down on yourself. And this, that's how a lot of people get cynical. I mean, I call it, uh, on some of the streams I've done on left reckoning, uh, you know, my show left pessimism where people who really feel and they want to change the world. Um, they get into this rut when they realize that people around them are rising up and, and changing, um, you know, doing all these kind of things. And I understand why people fall into that kind of depression, but you have to beat the devil in Chris Christopherson's words. You have to know that like, you just got to be the guy who's keep on, you know, keep on fighting and trying to tell the truth. And eventually someone's going to hear, um, Anyways, before I get too somber, um, I also want to make sure I hit his country chops because uh, he has a song that's one of my favorite songs of all time. It's a really good country uh, music song called If You Don't Like Hank Williams. <laughs> um, so the lines go, I love Big Johnny Cash, and I think Will and Jennings is a table thump and smash. Playing with Marshall Tucker Band was as good as smoking grass, but if you don't like Hank Williams, Sonny, you can kiss our ass. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a guy who, who loves the music and the scene, also is a character of his own. And just to, to sort of close out, um, I don't know if I sent you this, Ben, but um, it was floating around this past week. Because uh, for people who might not be familiar, actually, there's this whole controversy in country music uh, obviously regarding Donald Trump and, you know, whatever Trumpism is, but you know, all these morons and the people who run that system now and the people who are big famous country singers, they are all like, Oh, we don't play. We're, I'm just a guitar player. I don't think about politics, which is such right. BS when you talk about like the actual yeah. history of country music, but you know, who does do a lot of um, political content is the country wives. So <laughs> like Jason Aldean, his wife just got in trouble for posting a bunch of Q stuff. Like all their country wives are getting in trouble 
um, for posting these really insane Donald Trump memes. Uh, but anyway, somebody posted uh, this uh, story told by Ethan Hawke that came out, I think in 2009 or something like that um, in Rolling Stone. And like any good country story, it's, uh, you know, debated and, and whatever. I think some of the debaters are a little stupid. We'll get to that later. But anyways, this is Ethan Hawke. Uh, talking about a, a scene at Willie Nelson's, I think, 70th birthday party. Um, so up from the basement comes uh, one of country music's brightest stars, uh, who is Toby Keith, uh, who, right. if you're not familiar, is the one who's saying, you know, stick a boot up your ass is mm -hmm. the American way. Right. That's <laughs> my, uh, uh, my all-time favorite moron lyric, which is, I'm not a political man. I don't know the difference between Iraq and Iran. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is much more of a cell phone than I think that. <laughs> Then Toby Keith realizes. Anyway, um, happy birthday in the star. Toby Keith says to Willie. And and as he passes Chris Christopherson, who's standing next to Willie, uh, he says, uh, none of that lefty shit out there tonight, Chris. And Chris responds, says, uh, what the fuck did you just say to me? <laughs> oh, no, groans Willie under his breath. Don't get Chris all riled up. Uh, Toby Keith says, you heard me. And then Chris Christopherson, you know, he's in the military and stuff. You know, he wasn't in uh, Vietnam, which should be mentioned. But anyways, Chris Christopherson says, don't turn your back to me, boy. And Star turns around and says, I just don't want any problems, Chris. I just want you to tone it down. And then Chris responds, you ever worn your country's uniform? What? Don't want me, boy. You heard the question. You just don't like the answer. Um, I asked, have you ever... <laughs> um, have you ever worn the uniform? Have you ever killed another man? Have you ever killed, taken another man's life and then cashed the check your country gave you for doing it? No, you have not. So shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Uh, whatever um, Toby Keith says. And Ray Charles, who was there too, stood motionless. Willie Nelson looked at, at Ethan and shrugged mischievously. Um, and then Chris uh, looked at the wall, looks over at Willie and says, don't say a word. Um, and then he looks at Ethan Hawke and he says a, a quote. So this is the big uh, controversy about this because this is a country music quote that has been attributed to very many people and it's extremely vulgar. I don't know. If, can I say it on the air? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, but this has been attributed to a lot of different people. It's funny as hell. Um, but this is the kind of legend part of it. Um, but uh, Chris Christopherson looks to Ethan and he points at guys like Toby Keith and he says, they're doing to country music what pantyhose did to finger fucking. <laughs> So <laughs> true or not, um, it's a good, it's a good yarn. And uh, Chris Christopherson um, is a, is a man of legend for sure. Um, yeah. Well, and, and whatever we know, he had a way with words. So he may well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure I actually, I have no doubt about it that him and Toby Keith had an altercation. I'm just curious if that embellishment is true or not. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, Toby Keith really sucks. And anyways, Chris Christopherson, um, it is sort of funny out of all the people out of, you know, the main, the country music, like the highway men, the outlaw country music. I think he's probably like the least known for his politics, which is sort of ironic to me, given the fact that he actually is probably the most radical out of any of them. Yeah. Right. No, it's, I mean, you, you certainly couldn't, I mean, as, as much as, uh, you know, obviously, you know, obviously Willie Nelson, you know, Johnny Cash, you know, there, there are, you know, we could talk about these people and, you know, various good causes they've supported and, you know, and their activism for Native Americans. But I mean, Jesus Christ, that, uh, that, like the opening to, to that, 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 you know, to that San San Mista Mista song. Yeah. Yeah. And like, he wasn't just like giving that to the world. I mean, he was like there singing for those. I mean, that was, yeah, that so recording was in Spain, right? but he had been to Nicaragua and like had sang for the Sandinistas, the Sandinista song. Uh, that's not a passive endorsement at <laughs> no, no, that's very true. Oh, uh, so what's um, uh, so you're you're a few couple episodes into uh, Left Reckoning now? Yeah, man, it's been going really well. Uh, we've been having a lot of fun. What's up, Vic? Hey, how's it going, guys? Hey, um, yeah, it's been going really well. Um, I think uh, this week we're doing a in depth interview with Milton Alamani. Nice, nice. Uh, on what's going on with Bobby Wan. In Uganda, so it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a good one. So definitely check that out. Nice. Thursdays at eight. We're moving it to eight. We decide eight, uh, seven p.m. is a little too East Coast. So mm. we're <laughs> we want everyone to be able to watch live. Totally, so. totally. Yeah. Ah, uh, fair enough. 
Um, maybe I should, uh, I should do that. Although, <laughs> you know, this is already like, you know, this already ends late enough that, you know, I do it so. else to do it that night. You know, it's already screws with my old man's sleep schedule. But, uh, <laughs> we start, we start somewhere between seven thirty and eight. No, that's, that's <laughs> true. In practice, it's, it's a little closer to eight, but, uh, <laughs> theoretically it's, uh, it's seven thirty. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, no, that's uh, everybody should be uh, should be watching that at uh, at Thursdays uh, Thursdays at eight. Uh, do you uh, do you know yet? By the way, um, no worries if you don't. But do uh, do you uh, do you know what you might want to cover next week? Um, maybe the Highway Man. All right, all right. Let's 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 put a you yeah. know put a pin in that and you know and figure that out. But that'd be fun if we do. So I think it's this app this time. All right. Okay. Thanks, brother. All right. Take care, y'all. All right. See you. All right. How are you guys doing? Oh, good. Uh, we are now joined with a, a much better connection than uh, last week uh, by, uh, <laughs> by Vic Bayana, um, who uh, was uh, was originally going to uh, do a substitute music segment when uh, Griscom was gone last week. But uh, since we couldn't do it then and I really wanted to do it, uh, we are going to uh, we're going to do it right now. Uh, so, uh, Vic is somebody who, uh, people, a lot of people who watch this, I imagine, uh, have, uh, have seen his work, uh, in, uh, in one form or another, uh, you know, probably some of the illicit histories for, uh, the Michael Brooks show. I think I said last week that, you know, that, um, uh, like the one, um, like the Jamaica one, like I always think of, that's like a, uh, uh, like it's such a, it's like, like, it's so fun to watch, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's so nicely put together. Like I always think like that's something you could show, um, like that's something you could show your like fairly apolitical brother-in-law who's interested in gangster movies, you know, like, and, and, and he'd end up learning a bunch of stuff about the history of socialism in Jamaica and U S imperialism and all of that. But, uh, but he'd still be into it. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, I remember, you know, when I used to be over at, uh, at, you know, Michael Brooks place and, you know, Brooklyn, you know, he'd like be always like, if there's one of those that had just come out, you know, he always wanted me to watch it. And he, was, he was like really excited and proud of those. Uh, and more recently, uh, they, well, actually both of you guys worked on the, um, uh, the, uh, Thomas Frank, like mini documentary for, uh, for the Jacobin channel, uh, which, uh, which we played on the, uh, you know, live stream here a while back. Um, so obviously Vic is a, uh, is a very talented guy, but none of that has anything to do with what I want to, uh, <laughs> uh, to uh, do tonight, uh, which is more just uh, that, you know, as I was, as I was saying, you know, last week, you know, before the, uh, the connection went on the Fritz, you know, I, I started doing this segment with, uh, with Griscom, uh, you know, because this was sort of my, um, you know, when, when I used to, you know, to go bar hopping with him, you know, that would be like the sort of end of the night, we'd be back at his apartment, you know, pour another drink, and then he'd like put on some music and tell me about it. And, you know, I was, oh, this is fun. You know, I want to share this, you know, with, with everybody, uh, the world in large, at large, or the percentage of the world that watches GTA. Uh, and, but, uh, but I think oftentimes, you know, if the, um, if the roles were, were reversed, you know, maybe not with him, but with other people, and uh and it was the end of the night it was at my apartment you know i was like pouring them drinks and playing the music probably what i'd play them would be much more like what i often see uh vic posted about <laughs> so uh so I, I thought it'd be fun to uh to do you know to do one of these segments and talk about some of that yeah totally no thanks for having me yeah so um so i've, I've seen you you know i've seen you a lot uh in in the past um you know, post about a lot of the kind of uh, like 1970s kind of, you know, rock music that, uh, that, that I've always really liked also. Uh, so, you know, um, you know, Zeppelin, um, Ozzy era Sabbath, uh, you know, things, uh, you know, things like that. So, you know, I, I thought that, yeah, I thought this might, might just be a fun opportunity to, uh, to, to just, you know, to just chat about a few of your favorite albums. We're not going to worry too much about, you know, what we, what we cover in the next 15 or 20 minutes. You will be back. Right. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we kind of started talking about Black Sabbath a little, so we can start there for uh, sure. this week. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I mean, it's funny because this, uh, you know, 
this stuff was old when you know I started listening to it, right? But yeah. for whatever reason, it's just you know it, that period just really like stands the test of time, um, mm -hmm. you know. And I think I mean Sabbath, you know, uh, you know what it is about them too is that they you know invented metal but deep down they're really like just a blues band you know like yeah. when you some of their stuff it's like okay they, they down tuned everything and made it all you know awesome you know, well, horror well, movie lyrics but like you know it's like so not like basic you know i'd say basic blues by by just you know to mean that it's like um at its roots you know that that's what it is so it is kind of funny that like that sound just kind of endures yeah i mean uh, i mean ozzy osbourne says that in his memoir which by the way um i check that out yeah, I'd, I'd really recommend that book, actually. I don't know how much, I mean, look, I'm sure, like, uh, I'm sure to some extent you have to read it as like a novel that his ghost, you know, came up right. with the basis of whatever Ozzy mumbled at him. But right. so, you know, whoever is responsible for writing however much of it, uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a really good read. And he actually has a line in there where he says, um, I, you know, people say we invented something called uh, called heavy metal, but I don't understand that because seventies metal, eighties metal, nineties metal, it's all totally different. As far as I was ever concerned, we were a blues band who played some spooky songs. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the, you know, the cool thing about them too is that you know, kind of the whole um, get their whole guitar sound was a total accident and kind of like a product of obscene working conditions in Northern <laughs> England at the time. Cause you know, Tony Iommi famously, he worked at a factory, you know, while they were starting out as a bar band, I think he was like 18 or 19 when this happened. And he, um, on his like day before he quits, right. Because they got have a bunch of gigs finally lined up. He, um, you know, he cuts two of his fingers on a machine and gets the fingertips like literally, you know, has to, yeah, yeah. That, like down. As and I, then that's why he down tunes his guitars from then on. And then everyone else, you know, in the band had to down tune as well, or the bass player had to down tune as well. And so, you know, it is kind of funny that it's like yeah, a it's product a, of its material conditions. Yeah. It's down to the English working class. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Right. Like, and, and that is also a big, um, yeah, I was thinking also in that Aussie book, you know, he talks about like sort of growing up, uh, really, I mean, kind of forget, like, you know, not very long at all. Uh, after the uh, the end of World War II, so he said yeah. like some of the, the places that they like treated as playgrounds and like you know played in as kids were like were like bomb sites, you know that like you know just yeah. like sort of blown up patches of uh, of, <laughs> of ground that the kids turned into a playground. And yeah, as as um, as you say, uh, my my understanding of that Tony Yomi story is is that actually it's uh, it's even slightly worse because he um, came home at lunchtime. Right. And, and, and said, and he was living with his, uh, his, his mom, at least maybe mm -hmm. both of his parents at the time and said, look, I'm, um, you know, today's my last day. We're going to, you know, start touring or whatever. Uh, I think I might not, I think I might not go back. It's, you know, oh, like, 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 this is, this is, you know, this is silly. Like why, why even do this? Like I last few hours of industrial labor and his mom said, no, Tony, you know, this, right. you, you know, finish out, right. Go back and finish the day. <laughs> and then he gets into this industrial accident, you know, cause of these, uh, these horrifying conditions. And really, I mean, I think, you know, without necessarily dwelling in the politics too much, I think you can yeah. like, you know, hear that in some of it, like, um, you know, I really, as much as we don't usually think of, uh, of of radical politics, you know, with with Black Sabbath, like like that is that is there. I mean, right? There are those. Yeah, uh, for sure. War pigs. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, right. They they just started the war. They don't go out and fight. They leave that to the poor. Right. You know? like, <laughs> like it doesn't get much more explicit than that. Totally. Yeah, I mean, and too, like when they did bring it up, right? It was always like that, where it was like, um, you know, I mean, there were some songs, I guess. Like Children of the Grave, that's another one. Um, you know, that's kind of about that same thing. But you know, yeah, and Warpix is just so like, yeah, this is what it is. We're not gonna kind of hide behind any kind of metaphor or anything. Um, yeah, that's that's another fun one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which right? I mean, of course, there are other songs that they yeah, there are. Um, well, at, at different times, they they try less and more to hide behind metaphors for other things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, more than uh, politics. The uh, so right. I'm thinking, like for example. Uh, there's uh, Snowblind. Uh, right, and Sweet Leaf. The other. Your Sweet Leaf, yeah, yeah, both of those. Right? <laughs> both awesome songs for doing those respective tracks. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, especially, and both of those songs, I think, really capture the mood of, uh, of those two things, you know? Right, but, uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, especially because, yeah, um, right, I think on, 
yeah, Black Sabbath Volume Four, right? There's I think there's uh, Supernaut, and then there's Split Snowblind right yeah, after yeah. that. And Supernaut is one of those songs that has like this this sort of turn in the middle where it kind of kicks up into a uh, yeah you know, higher gear. Snowblind is just there the whole time, which uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, which I think usually I think maybe in the studio album context we're a little bit more um, you know they're a little bit more uh, indirect and coy about. Although there is I I, I do remember listening to a um, uh, to a live album from uh, from from the eighties, that's like Ozzy and Randy Rhodes, where he just he just opens up like Snowblind with "This is a song about cocaine." <laughs> that's great, <laughs> but uh, but of course it's uh, you know I mean it's it's not all it's not all like that, right? You know you do you do have stuff that's that's in a much more uh, direct and obvious way is is from that you know that that bluesy tradition, and you have uh, and you have songs on all of those albums that are like you know like quiet and even you know even kind of mournful. Yeah, absolutely. That kind of like dirge sound. Um, I'm trying to think of a one. Or there's this one under the sun that's on volume four, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, 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 that one's very yeah. That's a very chill track. Like I had it come up on like another playlist the other day, and was like, oh, this doesn't exactly sound like Sabbath when you first think about it. But yeah, yeah, well, they were steeped in that kind of psychedelic. I think it's because of all the psychedelic things that were going on at the time. They were really steeped in that too. They kind of pulled from like multiple different uh, directions of what was going on at the time. Yeah, no, that makes uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, you know. And and again, it is even though you know we we associate it with uh, you know later metal that was was influenced by it, um, and you know obviously there is that like distinctive thing, you know, that they're they're pulling you know the the name of the band and you know me lyrics for right. some songs from you know some kinds of like you know pulp and horror movie things. Uh, but you know, I mean that that kind of combination of of musical styles, you know, is is something that you get with a lot of seven days bands that we wouldn't associate with that tradition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's fun too when you hear about how they just decided to start approaching. Right, they saw the movie Black Sabbath, and then they were like, "Oh, what if we?" I think they, Ozzy even said that they asked, "Like, what if we made horror music? Like, how there's horror movies?" And that's just kind of how you know they took the title and just ran with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then you know, I think that that riff too, Tony Homie wrote it and was like, you know, it sounds like um, that scale is like the the old gothic kind of scale. I, I don't actually know any music theory, but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I know enough to, you know, enough to know. Like <laughs> vaguely have heard these terms. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. No, but I mean, it, it definitely does have that you know, horror, like yeah, horror movie soundtrack, you know, kind of kind yeah. of gothic, you know, feel to it. You know, the uh, the actual song Black Sabbath. Um, so, uh, yeah. So somebody in, in chat reminds us, right. You know, there was this like brief period, right. The name was going to be earth. Yeah. I'm going to look this song up <laughs> once I get up. That's, that sounds very interesting. Um, yeah. Um, and, and it is also, it is also interesting. So I, I think last week, you know, when we didn't quite succeed in doing this segment, I, uh, you know, uh, like I mentioned, there there is you know there is something that's in all that kind of horror imagery that they, um, you yeah, know, I mean, obviously that you know this is something that they've always you know played you know they always played up and played to you know this this um, mm-hmm. this sort of wow this is like really like you know evil and satanic you know that uh, you know that that you know like sort of Ozzy doing the, you know, the Prince of Darkness shtick yeah. and there's the, and uh, I mentioned, our, I think that, yeah, when I saw their uh, reunion uh, concert, you reunion tour in uh, Florida in uh, 2013, I remember like one of the images they were projecting on the, uh, on the screen during the concert was of some like 1970s, like evangelical, yeah. you know, protester holding up signs saying Black Sabbath exalts Satan. Yeah. Uh, but actually, of course, uh, really does it, right? I mean, the actual, uh, the actual right. lyrics uh, right. are, are not, you know, really almost ever, you know, at all like that. You know, if anything, right. like War Pigs, you know, has the, has the lyric about the, uh, the, the, the generals and war planners, you know, being like, where, right. you know, witches gathered at Dark Sabbaths, you know, it's not a compliment. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, most of their songs are about how, like, scary and bad the devil is. <laughs> right. <laughs> it is fine. I mean, yeah, I mean, well, you know, the uh, Christian right's not exactly known for their subtle approach to things, to reading things. But, um, 
Yeah. yeah, no, that is, I mean, it's funny that over time, like that's now just like a funny footnote for Black Sabbath. Whereas like in the seventies and eighties, like that was like a legitimate thing that, you know, these conservative people organized around. Um, you know, like I remember back in the day, you know, VH1 would do all these like music history retrospectives and they, you know, they you know, had a bunch of stuff on the, um, the uh, parents music, uh, right? Whatever. Yeah. That, yeah. The parents music council or whatever, the Tipper yep. Gore thing and those yep. hearings. And it's just wild that like, I mean, we talk about like the culture war now, but like that stuff is the fact that people took that, that seriously is kind of nuts. Oh yeah. Uh, I think Chapo did a thing about the, oh. uh, the, the Tipper Gore Parents Music Council, whatever that was called, and uh, and, and and like some of what they got into, I, I don't remember who the guest was, but some mm -hmm. of what they got into in there is crazy in retrospect. Like the stuff that like the you yeah. know that uh, you know Tipper Gore and everybody was obsessed with at the time. You know, it's like you know it's like how evil like Prince is. You know, like stuff right. like that. <laughs> like, Hard to wrap your mind around, you know. How right. that was, you know, it's, like that was really the issue. It's before. super. It's super low stakes culture wars. Yeah, you know I mean, like, like who's gonna if if you're upset that kids are like might be listening to the explicit music, like who's really gonna be upset that you're coming after that? You know what I mean? Right, mm -hmm. right. Especially, especially if you're like a like a presidential or vice presidential candidate's wife or something, and you're looking for an issue to capitalize on like that right. is, of course is going to be a big one because I don't know, like, it's not like anyone's going to be like, no, I'm super pro. Like right. kids listening to, to the most, well, I guess it also has, it comes from that, like protect the children attitude that yeah. people have about like, yeah. Yeah. Like the, the Helen love joy. Will somebody please think of the children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 And, and what the children are being protected of from in this case is right. like, you know, I don't know sex horror movie imagery you know right. like, like drugs and rock and roll <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, you know um and yeah it's all very you know culturally specific and the way that uh, you know and how quickly uh it can it can shift is is really remarkable like i remember uh several years back you know, uh, watching the, uh, you know, the Super Bowl in like, uh, I don't know, 2012 or something. And, um, and, you know, as like, you know, getting ready to do the opening kickoff, you know, they're playing from uh, Ozzy's first uh, solo album, you know, Chaos, Crazy Train. And I remember thinking like, this is amazing because like, look, when this album came out, right, there were people who there were like these big lawsuits about how right. was, like encouraging teenagers to commit suicide. And now it's so wholesome you can play it at the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, you know, the Super Bowl has its own history of like weird, uh, you know, musical. Well, I guess they, you know, they decided it was, you know, that sexy things were too much. And then they kind of veered hard into like the classic rock stuff for a while. So then I guess that's how all that got grandfathered in. <laughs> I mean, it's also how Democrats can show, you know, over time that they're culturally conservative enough to be taken right. seriously by like Southern and you know what I mean? Like, like more rural voters because all of a sudden they're like, Oh, I'm not tolerant and liberal. Look at all this music. I don't like this music. I don't right. like it. Especially in that era of like, you know, Al Gore from Tennessee and yeah, 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 yeah. That totally makes sense. Cause they were, I mean, it seems like in hindsight, it was like the liberal Democrats who were riding that hard to a certain extent and like the Christian right too, but it was kind of a bipartisan thing too, which is wild. It's the, I mean, it's the why should the uh, why should the Republican Party have a stranglehold on the <laughs> kind of right. theory? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, which was a lot of the explicit theory, you know, behind um, uh, behind Bill Clinton and uh, and the uh, the Democratic Leadership Council uh, that by taking you know these you know kind of culture war issues, although culture war including things like crime and welfare. You know that like by riding to the right on them like this is what i mean this as crazy as this is and hard as this is to remember the explicit theory was that they were gonna like take those issues off the table because if if they you know if they went crazy right wing on them if they you know if they you know bill clinton you know added a hundred thousand cops to the street and you know ended welfare as we know it right. uh then uh then the republicans just couldn't run on those things anymore and of course you know what we've you know that's that's not really what we've seen well, look at well, look at Bill Clinton even like literally executing a mentally like handicapped uh, like person in in Arkansas. Like he did that right before the election, so they can't say that he is soft on the death penalty. 
Right. It was horrific. And like even his own friends were like, please don't do this. Like this is not something you have to do. And Bill Clinton turned around and literally right before the election just executed the guy. Yeah, yeah, who, yeah, who, right. Was apparently so severely mentally handicapped that the story is that he uh, asked for some of his last supper to be put aside for later. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There's the uh, the uh, Christopher Hitchens book uh, from the '90s, uh, "No One Left to Lie To," uh, about uh, mm-hmm. about Bill Clinton. Like the yeah, the, the section in there about uh, Willie Ray Rector that that. Uh, a uh, death row inmate, you know, is, is just, is just harrowing. And it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's the, uh, you know, uh, early leftist Hitchens at his best, you know, they're sort of right. talking about like how, you know, this is the, uh, you know, apparently he, uh, he thought like that the, uh, that, that the doctors were, you know, looking for a vein, you know, for the lethal, the lethal injection, you know, we're like, you know, we're, we're like that this was just some like regular medical procedure. And he talks about how this is like, some people from this background, this is the only place they could get medical care was in prison, you know, and, right. and so it's, it's just, you know, and anyway, this, this went in a much grimmer direction than I was planning on for, uh, <laughs> for this, uh, this conference. Well, that's just how Ozzy would have <laughs> fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we're thinking about this era, right, I mean, it's funny because I'm of the age where I first yeah. heard of Ozzy Osbourne because of the show The Osbournes, yeah, right. <laughs> in middle, which would have been when I was in middle school-ish. Um, and so it's just, yeah, I was watching, I went back and like watched some of that on YouTube a couple weeks ago. Uh, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's just very funny early reality TV. It's just kind of him, you know, yelling at his family and not being very, uh, you know, articulate. Yeah. Uh, which is crazy. Cause, uh, cause he enunciates so clearly what he's singing. Right. <laughs> you know, somehow, whatever he's just talking. Like, oh. Right. Yeah, I mean, even when you saw him for that reunion show a couple of years ago, like his vocals were still uh, on point, more or less. Or yeah, 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 uh, that's still yeah. funny. I guess like it's it must be like a I think it's like a mental process, right? If you're vocalizing, it's a little easier to enunciate, yeah. and you know, because you have to elongate your vowels and stuff. And... Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's I true, true, but yeah. That's yeah, true. there is even like the one like uh, like reunion album they put out around that time. It's the uh, it's like a studio album. I remember there's like the track. Oh, oh God is dead on it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 which is like when they're finally like, okay, hell, you know, like all the other stuff was about you know saying this scary and bad, but like whatever. This is you know this, this is a real scary what shit. We're associated <laughs> with this, you know, we're gonna you know we're gonna like you know get some juice out of this. Let's just play to it. Right. <laughs> Uh Forrest, were you gonna say oh, something? Yeah, about? sorry. Um, the Osborne is, I mean, it's kind of like the model for later, like reality yeah. family TV shows, and now there's so many of them. But I mean, that yeah, really, I mean, really as far as I can remember, yeah. And it, and it's funny yeah. that that's the family that they chose because you know what I mean. Like it, they are such a like a strange combination of people. I feel like once <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um. And yeah, I think uh, like a, and it's it's actually the the family history is pretty weird. Also, like uh, like Sharon Osborne, you know his uh, his wife, you know, it's like uh, her father was the producer for for Black Sabbath, who kind of uh, you know like who kind of kicked Ozzy out of the band, you know, when they, uh, oh. they, they transitioned to the Dio, you know, era. So it's it's like it's 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 like the like it's 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 a, like it's got to be like a, a pretty strange. Uh, set of uh, set of family relationships there um <laughs> i like that somebody in chat says the snl skit where uh, ozzy sings so the guy at mcdonald's can understand <laughs> i haven't seen that but i can no yeah I, I can absolutely imagine that all right look i don't want to i don't want to hold you any longer but this was fun we absolutely have to uh, to do this again and uh, and do it for other bands for uh, yeah definitely for- anytime man all right all right Thank take care so have a good night guys all right thanks all right. Uh, if uh, if people have uh, any other super chat questions, uh, we will uh, we will do that at the end when we wrap up. Uh, meanwhile, I do want to do uh, a, a little preview of uh, episode twenty five coming out on Thursday for patrons, uh, which is going to be continuing uh, the monthly series of Sopranos recaps that I've been doing with uh, Mike Racine, uh, Nando Vila and uh wasney uh big was lambre so it's a uh, it's a very um you know it's a very slow uh 
you know, scenic tour, you know, through, uh, through the Sopranos. If you, uh, if you haven't watched and you started watching because of this, you know, you probably started watching the first time we did one and finished already, uh, the, uh, all, you know, six or seven seasons, depending on how you count it. Uh, but it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun to, uh, to do them. And, uh, and, and I think every, every single one of these has been pretty good. All right. I am now joined by Nando Vila, Wozni Lambre, and Brendan Falone to, uh, to talk about uh, the, uh, the third episode of the first, uh, first season of The Sopranos, Denial, Anger, Acceptance. So uh, thank Which you, guys. You? I'm, I'm Denial. <laughs> okay. I'm Tony Soprano in that episode where he plays golf with Cusimano and his friends and realizes they were just mocking him the whole time. <laughs> That's what that's what I'm gonna. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Uh, now this is uh, yeah. What so this is um, honestly this I thought this was kind of an intense episode. Like it was spectacular. Uh, yeah, it was so good. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, so um, I mean, I think yeah. Just as an episode, I think certainly you know the best episode of the first three. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'll I'll also say at, at the risk of uh, of make, making this not fun, but which is not my intention, that like this definitely hit differently for me this time than the last time I saw the episode, which was I think in 2019 when I started the last uh, rewatch, because the whole thing is about different characters facing death and thinking about the reality of death and you know how they're going to handle your dick cut off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. I had my dick cut off this year, so like that was really cool, but, you know. I think this is the best episode of the season so far. Yeah. And I've seen yeah. this episode four times because I've watched the show twice, but then I watched this episode for another podcast that I did. And there's so I much. cheated on this podcast episode. With another podcast <laughs> two years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, there's just so much there that I didn't see the first three times I watched it. Yeah. Because yeah. the show never the show never beats you over the head with anything, you know? No. Right. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And that's why oh, people no. like my mother-in-law like it. Because not she she feels like it's just a show about Italian guys killing each other, right? <laughs> the the subtleties are just that they're they're very subtle. I you know what's so crazy? I never some of the more like I don't even know like the the stuff about Tony with the art, yeah. Like I never understood that. Like upon first watching it. I was just like, what's like this shit is over my head. You know what I'm saying? Like when I first watched it, but like watching it now, you know, you 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 notice what Tony's like he's signaling what's happening, right? Like, like he's he's noticing things and not saying it. And because he doesn't say it, he's just constantly internalizing it. How it comes out is in these bursts. You know, but you you see him noticing the shit with his friend not getting the chemo, like lying about getting chemo, just like fuck it, I'm done. Get me out of here. Um, you know, you see it with so many of these other things, and then like <laughs> you know, like <laughs> whenever people are talking about the fire, yeah, and Artie's like, what kind of fucking animal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. well, this is like this is the first episode where we see a bit like the quintessential to me the quintessential Tony Soprano trait, which is very much like a American male trait in in, in many ways, which is that like this incredible, uh, almost incredible victim complex, an incredible kind of uh, um, inability to confront the consequences of one's own action, yeah. right? Like where he's just like, he gets mad, like he burns down Artie's restaurant and then gets mad at him for reminding him how fucked up yeah, that was. That's right. That's you right. Know? Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. It's like the same thing with the, with the, the bad guy in Terminator mm-hmm. 2, Robert Patrick, like that sub, subplot down the line where he like ruins this guy's life. Right. And then when the guy starts crying, you know, because he's just like, my life is ruined. <laughs> Tony gets mad that because he's reminded that he ruined his friend from high school's right, right, life. Right. And he's just right. like, "Look what you're doing to me! Like, how can you remind me of this awful? Like, this make me? How can you make me feel this bad about this? You know, it's just it's it's a classic Tony trait." Yeah. All right, so uh, you can get the uh, the rest of that episode and every other one of the uh, the Thursday 
patron, patron episodes uh, by going to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. Uh, so uh, five bucks, uh, five bucks a month. Uh, I'll, I'll skip the usual Pulp Fiction joke because we've done enough Pulp Fiction in this episode. Uh, but for uh, for five bucks a month, uh, you get uh, that extra episode every week, uh, and you also get access to uh, the Discord server uh, and regularly scheduled, uh, we call them Discord office hours, uh, group voice chats. Uh, there's also other stuff uh, that's going to be coming down the pipe. We're not quite ready to, uh, to announce it. Uh, but it is all good stuff uh, as far as... Um, you know, as the regular public content uh, on the uh, on the subject of uh, gangsters, American anger, uh, we on Wednesday, along with uh, Forrest uh, and Daniel Bessner uh, and Jacobin, um, <laughs> uh, Jacobin deputy editor uh, Micah Utrecht, and I think also our friend uh, philosopher professor Ryan Lake. Uh, we are going to be doing a follow-up to our, um, you know, we've been doing these Wednesday movie review live streams. We're going to do a follow-up to uh, the one we did a little while ago about Goodfellas uh, and uh, all uh, five or whatever that is of us uh, have read uh, Wise Guy, which is the, uh, which is the book uh, about Henry Hill that uh, Goodfellas was based on. Uh, and so we are, uh, you know, we're going to do a stream where we talk about the, um, you know, uh, some of the real stuff that, you know, that was in the movie, some of the real stuff that was, uh, that was left out of the movie. Uh, you know, so if you, if you've seen, uh, if you've seen Goodfellas and what's wrong with you, if you haven't, uh, you know, that's, that one should be a lot of fun to watch. It's pretty, it's pretty spot on. It's kind of a curated, I'd say it's a curated, uh, Goodfellas is a curated version of, of wise guy. Like it, it's yeah. less that, like, it's less that he changed it as much as he kind of decided what to keep in and what to take out. I was kind of surprised by a lot of that. No. Yeah. Like it's, it's pretty practically everything that's in the movie is, uh, is, is in the book. Uh, there are, um, you know, I mean, I think there are some, yeah, I think there are interesting omissions. I think there are things where just for storytelling reasons they are compressed together, uh, you know, there, there'll be things that, you know, happened, you know, over a few nights that are, that are kind of smushed into one event, you know, because it's more dramatic. Uh, I think that one of the most, um, you know, like, I think one of the most telling changes is that uh, Tommy, the Joe Pesci uh, character in Goodfellas, uh, so that that is a guy, you know, Tommy DeSimone, who, will, will, you know, several of the things that Tommy does in the movie are things that Tommy DeSimone did. Um, well, you know, but, uh, also it's a little bit of a composite character because there are like other things that are like just, you know, crazy things that other gangsters did, uh, that, you know, that are turned into things yeah. that Tom does in the movie, you know, which, which again, makes sense. Henry, Henry, yeah. No, yeah, Henry's best friend, is, Henry's best friend is a, is a different guy in the book. It's, it's, uh, Polly's son. And he's not in the he's not in the movie, but they kind of composite the scenes that Henry has with him into um in, into into the Tommy character, which is you know, yeah, no, with, yeah. I mean, again, I think dramatically it makes sense both for simplicity and also just because uh, I think that for the sake of storytelling, it makes sense to have there be one super crazy out there gangster, you know, who's, yeah. who's doing horrible, crazy, abusive stuff all the time to, uh, you know, for this, the sake of contrast, you know, with the other P characters who are, you know, kind of sociopaths, they are in the mafia, but mm -hmm. they're not like that. Uh, whereas the actual mafia, I mean, look, structurally a problem with having a mafia. I mean, this is kind of <laughs> like what, uh, Michael Albert was talking about, you know, about, uh, you know, about business enterprises and, you know, all, and, and the, you know, unequal distribution of power that, you know, leading, you know, some people to be able to treat other people in these totally instrumental ways, you know, we'll cut off the air conditioning, we'll let the fumes circulate through the factory, you know, um, but part of the problem with having a mafia is that that's just like, a, like giving people that pass that, you know, they can do basically whatever they want to people who aren't members Yeah, uh, is going to lead to, unbelievably over-the-top crazy behavior. I mean, half of the surprise is about this. 
So uh, of course it's not just one guy who's, who's doing all of this, but um, so they, they kind of consolidate all the super crazy stuff. Uh, into, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's exactly, it's the, it's what would happen if we had the same incentive structure that we do now, but then we took, like, like we made it completely lawless. Like it, it's yeah. a kind of, it's almost like a narco or a narco capitalist, like a narco capitalist, hellscape is kind of no i think a narco capitalist hellscape is exactly the right description yeah. in fact, if you if you talk to people like on the uh, episode where i had uh, walter block on uh and i i think he said this in there uh that um you'd have okay in, in his you know an narco capitalist paradise uh you'd have courts uh and you know security agencies they'd just be private security yeah agencies and, private yeah, and, that's, and that's exactly what it is also, and Cap, like and Cap Joe Pesci would be a hilarious. Oh like, my God, character! <laughs> God, I, I I would love to see the uh, the Michael Brooks and and Cap Joe Pesci. You know, he'd he'd be like, you can't trample on my freedom. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. He'd be screaming about Bitcoin and the non-aggression principle. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, how, how he he felt aggressed against by whatever just happened. But yeah, look, if you had the private security agencies, the private courts. Then uh, the obvious follow-up question, which I think I did ask Walter Block, is is what happens? You know, like what happens when they disagree with each other? You yeah. know, as people inevitably will, right? You know, who? You know, what falls on this? You know, you know what the actual line is between this person's property, what that person's property is, right? You know, there's never well, been a society where they have been disagreements, and, have and the it. options yeah. are pretty much the same as the mafia's options. Yeah, right? like if yeah. you have a disagreement with another family. Either you have a sit down and you come to an agreement or you fight about it. And the problem is going to be the same one uh, that, you know, in fact, that uh, Nicholas, how do you say his last name? The guy who wrote the book. Pelagi. Okay. Nicholas Pelagi um, talks about in, uh, in Wise Guy, which is that, look, when you do the sit down, whose interests are actually going to be taken care of in yeah. the sit down. Like it's uh, it's not going to be some random like shopkeeper who, you know um, you know, who's, who's getting trampled, you know, who might be like, who might belong to one of the gangsters. Uh, but, you know, they don't really have a lot of direct input. You know, they like, they, they're pretty much going to get like, they're pretty much going to accept whatever they're given as a result of that. Yeah. And, and the same point applies even more generally, you know, that like if you have, like yeah, if, if you if you don't have the money to hire your own security agency or you know like buy you know fund your own court or whatever, uh, then uh, then it's it's a pretty good bet that like whatever happens at the sit down is not going to favor your interests. Well, it's feudalism at that point. I mean, like you know, if you're in that kind of anarcho capitalist society where at that point you've taken away all of the laws completely, pretty much, and then it's just whatever's in people's interests. I mean. You're you're serving a feudal lord, and then that feudal lord gets to decide what you keep, and then how much of that they keep. So you know what I mean. So at that point, you have you have no property. Like the mafia, nobody in the mafia has property. They have little bits of, uh, you know, they they have little little bits of things that they can skim from other things, but they're always paying huge amounts of their income as tribute to somebody else. And then that doesn't change based on whether you've had a good day or a bad day. That just is your tribute. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's one of the more memorable. Uh, yeah. rants for the movie you know you had a uh business is bad fuck you where's my money the place burned down yeah. fuck, fuck, you, pay me. fuck you yeah and they say that that actually is taken right out of the book too i think but um yeah no it, it's at that point you're kind of just at, at the mercy of other people which is the ironic thing about anarcho-capitalism in general like they say that they don't want taxes in any form like that's their main that's their main agreement with the system that we have now is that they have to pay taxes if you're paying tribute to a feudal lord you know what I mean? In that situation like that, that's more of a tax just for oh, no, exactly. I mean, look, rent is a, uh, you know, rent is a tax that we, uh, that we pay to landlords uh, that, you know, like the, the difference is in who is entitled to it and what the, what the mechanism is for, uh, you know, for making you pay it. Although, yeah. uh, although, you know, you can, you can claim that putting somebody out on the street isn't coercion, but I don't think that's how most human beings would see it. Uh, and, and it's certainly, and look, the principle is the same. I mean, this is, I mean, you could, you could summarize a lot of the, uh, you know, of, of the disputes that have happened about things like rent freezes, you know, in, uh, in the last, you know, 11 months or so, uh, you know, 10 or 11 months by saying, Hey, you know, COVID fuck you pay me. Yeah. 
lost your job? Fuck you, pay me. There you go down the list. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's the same it's the same principle, right? You know, like, you know, food, fuck you, pay me. Like it's I don't it's I mean it, it completely drains everybody of their empathy to exist that way. And, yeah. and, I mean, yeah. and, and, and and we can recognize that when it's like a mob movie, but like we, like a lot of people don't recognize it when it's like the system that we have in place now, because it's all that they've ever, like, like they can recognize it in their own lives, but like they don't recognize it as a structural incentive to take away that empathy. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, yeah, I think that, I think actually there's a, uh, you know, there's a pretty, uh, there's a, there's a pretty extensive uh, parallel there. And yeah, yeah, I know that, you know, the, obviously the mob does lots of things that would violate the rules of, you know, um, of this, you know, anarcho-capitalist paradise. Although we can also ask questions about who enforces those rules and that makes it a lot more like the mob. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, in a way, it's kind of what Michael Albert was talking about at the end there about how if you just assume that everybody's going to be on their best behavior, uh, then, um, then sure, it's, it's, it's easy to describe what sounds like a good society, but you know, that's a, uh, you know, that's a hell of a, uh, of, of an assumption to make. And so I think that actually, if we, if we did not have a centralized state and we just had a bunch of private security agencies owned different rich people, then it would be even more like the mob <laughs> than, uh, than what we've been saying so far. Uh, but yeah, that's coming up on, uh, on Sunday. Uh, and oh, that's uh, on Wednesday, right? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. coming up on Wednesday. Thank you. Yeah, the movie ones are on Wednesday, so that's coming up on Wednesday. And uh, on Sunday, we're going to be continuing the uh, debate series. That's going to be uh, Bhaskar Sankara is going to be joining us. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I I floated it to him. He's still looking at it, but I think uh, I think we're going to watch uh, the debate that happened in the '90s between Christopher Hitchens and some guys from the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, so uh, so that should be uh, that should be fun. And then uh, for uh, the next regular episode on uh, Monday. Uh, we are going by by that point, um, you know, unless some uh, super hysterical liberal fantasy comes to pass, um, then uh, then Joe Biden will be president. Uh, you know, he, he should be sworn in, uh, you know, two days after we're recording this. Uh, so I thought that it would I thought it'd be interesting to uh, to go right into it with the uh, the first episode of the Biden era uh, being a panel on uh on biden's foreign policy you know biden and u.s empire uh so that is going to be uh katie halper uh our our friend and frequent guest daniel bestner and uh rania Kalik, who actually hasn't been on the show before uh so um so that should be a lot of fun uh please uh, please tune in then uh if you uh, if you can swing it uh, you know, uh, please do consider joining the uh, joining the Patreon. Five bucks a month, get that extra episode every week, uh, and uh, and support everything. That, it's, nice, you know, it's nice to let uh, it's nice it's nice to let uh, Bessner have a have a, I guess a, a stream that he's not going to have to defend himself on Twitter for the next. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> He did the one in fashionism with uh, with with Dan with Jason Stanley and everybody. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's right. Why is that one? <laughs> yeah, which which actually has been uh, so. Yeah, he did that, and then also we. Uh, I wrote a uh, I co-wrote an article uh, with Bessner on the same uh, on the same subject. Uh, you know, basically the uh, the fascism debate and the coup debate. Uh, so that was in uh, in Jacobin. Uh, came out uh, at the end of last week, uh, last Friday, I think. Uh, so it's called uh, Trump is a Threat to Democracy, but that doesn't mean that he's winning. Uh, and uh, we actually had, yeah, we actually had some fairly crazy, uh, you know, pushback uh, for uh, for this article. So uh, Noah Smith, who's a opinion, who's a uh, opinion writer for Bloomberg. Uh, and so, you know, it's like, you know, it's not the New York Times, but it's like a fairly mainstream, you know, uh, media position. Like a, uh, like a C-list New York Times, I feel like, when you get into the opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you get into Bloomberg opinion, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was uh, I was arguing with him uh, about uh, on, on Twitter, and it was just like, whatever, like this, this part isn't even like that excited. It was just like a pretty mundane sort of lefty versus liberal argument 
about the uh, the two thousand dollar check issue. Uh, you know whether um, whether telling people for months that you were going to do a two thousand dollar check and then doing a fourteen hundred dollar check is just fine because uh, you. Um, uh, because it adds up to two thousand dollars. Uh, yeah, it's like it's the broke guy defense. That's like you know they're like, oh, I'll give you two thousand dollars, don't worry. And then they're like, well, actually, you know, last week you got six hundred, and now you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't have all. What are we, the richest government in the world? Like, calm down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, yeah. The if you think about it, it, it it's we basically gave you 2000 because it adds up to 2000, you know, when we combine it with the money that you already spent back in December um, is I, I like uh, Gene Bajalan had a line about this uh, on Twitter about how this is basically the uh, political equivalent of the, Hey, sorry, baby. I thought we were on a break and you never yeah. asked. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah. Um, but so we were going back and forth about this and, you know, and, and about, uh, you know, Rashida Tlaib and whether, you know, he thought that it was ridiculous that since she was only pushing for uh, $2,000 in, in December. And so he said, well, okay, so she'd gotten her way. People would only get $2,000 total. So what's the difference? And I said, well, hold on. Um, what she's actually advocated for a long time is that the government be cut everybody monthly checks. Yeah. COVID's over. So if we're actually going to play the game of like what she advocates now should be what, um, you know, should be what she thinks the December plus January total should be. She should actually be advocating more than 2000 now. Uh, but you know, I mean, maybe 3,400 if it's going to be 2000 a month, you know, but, uh, yeah. uh, but that's then, that's like, he was the first one to say that, uh, the minimum wage should be, should be like $20 rather than the 15 when they were, yeah, yeah. She said, yeah, fifteen dollars made sense when fight for fifteen started, yeah. but you know, adjusting yeah, for yeah. now we should be pushing for more like eighteen or twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, all of these conservatives had that uh, that super like uh, super clever response of, oh, okay, fifty dollars isn't good enough anymore. Why don't you know twenty? Okay, why not just say yeah, everybody needs to get paid a thousand dollars an hour, yeah. uh, <laughs> which is you know uh, just to. Uh, you know, just to be a logic nerd about this for a second is the uh, continuum fallacy that, you know, just because you, uh, okay, a thousand dollars an hour would be too much. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the economy would crash. Uh, 18 or 20 is really fine. Uh, right. you know, and sure, you can't come up with the exact dollar amount of the cutoff, but you can't for most things. It's like saying that if we uh, start out with somebody who's totally bald and add a hair to their head, a hair to their head, a hair to the head. Then they'll be wearing a beanie on the stream. What do you say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Until such time as, and now they have, you know, they have as much hair as I do. There's a, uh, there's certainly, you know, look at the beginning of the process, they're bald at the end. They're not bald. Exactly. How many hairs do you have to have in your head for you not to be bald? Uh, good luck pinning that down to an exact number. You know, it has to be ten thousand exactly ten thousand eight hundred seventy nine hairs or whatever. I ask my um, girlfriend that question every day, <laughs> but it doesn't. Uh, that doesn't mean there's not a difference between baldness and and not being bald. Uh, and yeah. you know, this the same point goes here about you know yeah about what would count as a reasonable or just you know income uh, for uh, for for you know working people. Uh, so yeah, Rashida Tlaib, by the way, is uh, is one of my. Um, uh, yeah, I, is is one of my very favorite. Uh, like I, th I think she might be my favorite. You know, you know, member of Congress. Like, like, like she's she's just got like a, um, uh, you know, there's a very like earthy kind of, um, you know, like Detroit sort of, uh, you know, gonna gonna. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know. Like, like, like it seems like you know, it, it, it seems like you can sort of imagine her like hanging out at a dingy bar, you know, like sort of cheerfully bantering with people giving her shit about stuff like this. Yeah. Um, she's, but, she's very, she has a toughness. I think that it's hard for, you know, a lot of other progressive uh, Congress people to have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's actually, so this is a good deep cut for anybody who watched our um, history <laughs> live stream. Uh, uh, Jandra world, a graphic designer says De Niro from mean streets is a $1,400 guy. Uh, <laughs> but uh yeah, which is exactly right. So anyway, we were arguing about this, you know, me and this, you know, Bloomberg opinion writer Noah Smith. And out of nowhere, uh, he 
he starts um, accusing me, like we're having like a fairly dry argument about this fourteen hundred two thousand dollar thing. Uh, and out of nowhere, he he says that me and Daniel Bessner are uh, red brown because we wrote this article for uh, for Jacobin. You know this, which was you know I think anybody who read that article, I mean it's a it's a very anti-Trump article. I mean the, mm-hmm. the headline it you know starts you know Trump is a threat to democracy, but right you know this is obviously not you know a peon of praise to Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but because we said that, you know, that, that he's not, you know, literally a fascist that, you know, we should make some distinctions here that, you know, uh, that how we use these terms might have political consequences, uh, you know, that, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Salmon from the, uh, giving the mic to the wrong person podcast. If you don't know, you should check it out. <laughs> so, so who taught him that word with regard to uh, red Brown, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, that was, that was just like a, and then, um, and then Bessner responded to that. He was like, Hey, uh, Hey Noah, I'm a, uh, I'm a historian with, with expertise and Weimar and Nazi Germany and the uses to which, you know, fears of fascism have been put in U S politics historically. You want to pick a, pick a forum and, you know, me and you and Ben can discuss this. And, uh, he said that, um, uh, he didn't want to do that. Uh, for two reasons. One, it would raise our profiles, which is hilarious because I actually did debate Noah Smith like a year ago about Bernie versus Warren, uh, and he wasn't worried about that then. Uh, and two, because he doesn't even want to to give the juice to the, the fascism question by debating it because he said it would, I swear to God, I'm not making this up, it would distract the nation's attention uh, from like, you know, from, from, uh, you know, the bad stuff that Trump is doing to, uh, you know, resist the handover to debate whether he's a fascist. So, uh, you know, the, the nation uh, is being distracted by, by, you know, any arguments that, um, that this, as you say, like, you know, C-list, you know, uh, you know, mainstream media guy is, is having with a couple of Jacobin writers. You know what they say, as goes Bloomberg goes the country. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Like I think, <laughs> Probably like if we'd done that debate, if we did it on Wednesday, probably like half the people who would have otherwise watched the inauguration would watch me and Noah and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, debating uh, the definition of fascism. They sneak, uh, they sneak Trump up in there in like a in Trojan horse because everyone's too distracted watching the fascism debate. To... Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> but you know, thank God Noah Smith is keeping us safe from fascism by tweeting about it all the time. So, um, I mean, the thing also about the fascism debate, though, is that like actual fascists and neo-fascist movements, like the people that study fascism, like as an academic study, like they can't decide what qualifies as fascism. You know what I mean? Like, let alone whatever this is like. It, yeah, you know, right. Like, like no. the debate is endless because there's so many different characteristics that various fascists. Yeah, because what, you, what you're arguing about is because look, you say sure, uh, is Trumpism like classical European fascism, which is really what you're arguing about because you can you can call you like you can call Pinochet's Chile fascist, you know things like that, but that's already a little bit mm-hmm. of a metaphor. You know, you're saying what you're saying when you say that is it's like you know Hitler and Mussolini, which it certainly is in a lot of ways. Uh, but then, like you say, okay, is Trumpism like that? Well, obviously, the you know, like the the one uncontroversially true answer is it is in some ways, it isn't in others. Yeah, uh, that, you know, there are obviously uh, rhetorical similarities between Trumpism and classical European fascism. Uh, but then again, you could argue that that's mostly because there are, you know, the fascists were drawing on like a kind of. Re- a lot of the same rhetorical tropes used by lots of right wingers, both before and since. Mm-hmm. So Trump, you know, MAGA is a right wing movement, so of course it uses some of those same tropes. Uh, you know, of, so but look, if all you mean is is it analogous on that kind of rhetorical level, yeah, somewhat. Uh, there, are, you know, uh, if what you mean is uh, is it analogous in terms of the actual effects on the political system, clearly not. I mean, we just had an election, and Joe Biden is about to be president now. Uh, so, you know, so there's, there's clearly a big difference there. If you mean, uh, is some of what's done to, uh, to, you know, to immigrants, you know, reminiscent of like Gestapo tactics, then, uh, then yeah, I mean, I'd say, yes, it is. Although calling that a matter of Trump being a fascist, to my mind, kind of gets, um, the larger bipartisan establishment off the hook. I mean, ICE 
uh, wasn't created by Trump. It was created by George W. Bush and greatly expanded under Obama. And, and it, you know, it's reminiscent of a lot of the things that uh, center-right countries in Europe have done to immigrants and migrants that have come to their borders. I mean, more like ones from the Middle East than, than from uh, Latin America. But still, like, you know, you wouldn't call those countries fascist. You, you could criticize their immigration policy to the end of time, but you can't call them fascist. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah certainly nobody would. And there's and there's mm -hmm. also, and, and honestly, I think there's even a more grounded worry in terms of the GOP that especially now that after the, um, you know, riot, insurrection, whatever we're calling it, you know, on January 6th, that a lot more Republicans want to run away from, uh, from Trump. I mean, 10 Republican congressmen voted to impeach him. Uh, that making that distinction whether there's regular republicanism and and then there's then there's like trump fascism uh you know i mean i i think one worry that you might have about that is that it it allows the it allows uh the right to like kind of to trump wash a lot of the yeah. rest of the gop see they're just you know they're just regular reaganite republicans they're not like these crazy fascists and, and you see that happening already with you know, people like Mitch McConnell slowly turning on Trump because at the end of this, they're going to like, you know, push themselves back into the mainstream of, of establishment politics and say, well, we weren't, you know, with him till the end. We were, you know, we were with him when he was doing policy goals that we agreed with. But towards the end of it, like we realized he went too far, like people stormed the Capitol and that was too far. And you know what I mean? So, so you see that happening already. And you see in some cases, liberals being like, wow, even Mitch McConnell, like, no, like they were. Yeah, they welcome were to resistance, Mitch. Like they were, they were riding with Trump till the end. Like, and then you have to ask on policy, where do they differ? They don't like at no point, at no point do they differ. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there, you know, there's when, when it really came down to it, I mean, Trump might use some populist like rhetoric at times, yeah. but like, yeah, but, 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 but Trump by and large, there were exceptions, you know, uh, I think some of the immigration stuff was worse, but in, you know, by and large, uh, Trump governed pretty much the way that Mitt, Mitt Romney would have governed, uh, which is, um, you know, which is not to say Trump's not that bad. What it is to say is, yeah, you know, uh, all these people like 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 Mitt Romney or 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 you know John McCain, who was practically sainted, you know, in the mainstream media when he died, like all of these people are that bad, uh, you know. I mean, because it's not a matter. Of some special new Trumpist deviation, you know, uh, which is the the game that liberals always play. Like I remember, you know, I mean, look, I'm I'm 40, so I'm old enough to remember uh, in the Bush era uh, when it was um, when like there was this super common you know, like talking point that you heard everywhere about how Bush and Cheney aren't like regular conservatives; they're something new and special and dangerous. Uh, you know, there there were there were Republicans, you know, who said that, but certainly tons of liberals said that. Uh, and then, of course, they were, you know, the, you know, Bush and Cheney and all those guys, you know, were, uh, you know, largely been rehabilitated now uh, that, you know, that, that Bush Bush is like Kyle Bush is trotted out every once in a while as the nice, reasonable Republican to uh, to contrast with Donald Trump. Uh, and I, I and, you know, I'm quite confident that, look, unless Trump uh, has a you know heart attack or something, which he you know might very well have because he, you know. He seems to be in really bad shape physically. Yeah. But, um, you know, if he, uh, but if Trump like lives for another, you know, 10 or 15 years, I'm a hundred percent confident that at some point in the future, you know, uh, liberals are going to be trotting him out, you know, like, oh, this, um, you know, whatever demon the, uh, the Republicans have nominated now, he's like this really new special bad kind of Republican. Yeah. Um, reasonable Republicans like former President Trump don't approve of him. <laughs> um, somebody had a comment that was uh, like the the broad definition of neo fascism, and I wanted to make a point about it, but I'm trying. Yeah, to please. Think. Yep. Um, wrap up after that. Yeah. See, this, this is this is the thing that makes you know fascism such a slippery definition is because all right, so you know all of these different all of these different movements inside of it, like obviously the ultra nationalism has to happen, but racial supremacy, authoritarianism, xenophobia, like all, of, like all of these things, you know, what if, what if a movement doesn't have one of those things? Or what if the movement, you know, is like that in some ways, but isn't in others? Like, those are kind of broad concepts. And that's kind of what's always kind of like, 
I don't know, annoyed me about the term fascism in general. Like, yeah, well, and it's and, and it's also worth noting a lot of those things on that list uh, would apply to most, you know, right wing conservative movements. Yeah, uh, you know, opposition to liberalism and socialism. You know, uh, you know, we could argue about xenophobia, but you know, to to one extent or another. Uh, you know that there, there's certainly been uh, there's certainly been past uh, conservatives, you know, who who know, who weren't mostly thought of as fascists, who were who were much more openly racist, you know, than yeah. Uh, you know, like, than, but also like opposition to liberal democracy. Let's say like we had an election, like you know what I mean? Like we had an election and Trump lost. So like clearly, yeah, and, and you and you can say, oh, but he tried to overturn it. But then this is what confuses me about that is that in 2000. Uh, George W. Bush successfully overturned an election. Yeah. Uh, so if you're going to say that the clown show attempts to overturn it, you know, first, you know, by trying to convince Republican leg state legislatures to appoint alternate electors, which, you know, they wanted nothing to do with, uh, by, um, you know, by filing this long series of frivolous lawsuits that were thrown out of court, you know, like, Trump's appointees, uh, you know, uh, were uh, judges that Trump appointed were doing all but just, you know, writing lol fuck no on a piece of crayon like these things were thrown out so quickly. Um, and then finally resorting to this mob of, uh, of, of like QAnon nut jobs, you know, as like the last ditch effort to, to do something about the election. Uh, and even there, you know, in a very indecisive way, um, you know, I mean, again, there's, there's certainly, you can say there's a hostility to liberal democracy there, but as far as success in undermining democratic procedures, it's actually less successful than George W. Bush was 20, you know, 21 years ago, yeah. or I guess really James Baker is running the Republicans election effort in 2000. Uh, so it's, you know, the, the standards here uh, are very unclear to me. I, I I agree with you that I think a lot of this would probably be well served by, you know, if everybody just just decided to quit, you know, using these terms like neo-fascism to force themselves to say two or three sentences to explain what they mean, instead of um, instead of just slapping a label on it, uh, which which can often, you know, obviously we need labels as shorthands, uh, but uh, but but often the effect of having the quick label so you don't have to do the paragraph long explanation of your position is to actually uh, is to actually make it less clear. And the lack of clarity is a problem, especially uh, if we are going to go around making accusations like people are red brown or just crazy, insane, inflammatory, hyperbolic, things like that. But uh, that is a good place to uh, to wrap things for today. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, the Goodfellas follow-up stream and Wise Guy on Wednesday, uh, the, uh, the Sopranos uh, episode with, uh, with Mike Racine, Nando Vila, and Big Waz is dropping for patrons on Thursday. Uh, there's the, uh, the next uh, debate recap uh, with, uh, with Bhaskar on, uh, on Sunday, and the next regular episode uh, next uh, next Monday is the panel on Biden and U.S. Empire uh, with Daniel Bestner, uh, Katie Halper, and Rania Kalik. Uh, looking forward to that. I'll see everybody then. Uh, thank you for everybody who's who's stuck with us uh, uh, through uh, throughout this uh, this entire uh, this entire episode, um, which you know which which has gone a while. You know, I know when when we, when I started this, I said. Uh, this is not going to be like Feldman, you know, we're not going to do these like, uh, you know, crazy long episodes, uh, but, you know, we're slipping into it a little bit, but we are going to call it there uh, for tonight. Uh, so uh, thank you everybody for watching. Thank you, Forrest. Uh, and um, we'll see everybody, uh, see everybody next week. Left is best.